Good afternoon, good evening to all. Excellencies, Director General, uh, Mrs. Elizabeth Maruma Marema, Executive Secretary of the CBD, distinguished speakers, colleagues, and friends. Welcome to this global dialogue on the whole of food and agriculture in the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. This is the second global dialogue that FAO, in its role as biodiversity mainstreaming platform for the agriculture sectors, is co-organizing with the Convention on Biological Diversity. The moment is particularly timely with the ongoing development of the post-2020 global biodiversity framework and the preparations for the United Nations Food System Summit and the Food System Press Summit to be hosted by FAO at the end of this month. But what do we mean by mainstreaming biodiversity? Mainstreaming biodiversity across agri-food sectors means ensuring that biodiversity and the services it provides are integrated in the all relevant agriculture and food policies and practices. This aim is to promote sustainable agriculture practices to conserve, enhance, preserve, restore biodiversity as a whole. Therefore, biodiversity needs to be an integral part of all stages and levels of decision-making and actions. And in doing so, we'll be moving on the right path to fulfill our international commitments, our global promise to leave no one behind and the prosperous futures ahead, bringing the four betters, better production, better environment, better nutrition, and a better life to fruition. Ladies and gentlemen, before we move on, allow me to remind you of simple housekeeping rules. To avoid any background disruption, participants are muted. We have interpretation in Arabic, Chinese, English, French, Russian, and Spanish. You can follow a language by clicking on the globe icon at the bottom of your screen. This webinar is being recorded with a live Twitter feed. You can follow us using hashtag biodiversity. Ladies and gentlemen, I now have the honor to pass the floor to the FAO Director General, Dr. Chu Dong Yu, to open the global dialogue. Director General, over to you. The floor is yours. Thank you, Samantha. Good morning from Rome, and the dear colleagues, and also my older uh, uh, friend and the Executive Secretary Elizabeth. And uh, always, each time I, I met you, I feel uh, energetic and also the happy and bright. So that's that's a moon that we need to keep the uh, biodiversity. And also, it's more important to keep the food diversity for our generations to come to enjoy. Yeah. And the uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great honor for FAO to call organize this global dialogue together with the Convention on Biological Diversity. I'm so happy personally because when I was 42 years ago, started to, to, to go to university, I picked up the uh, bio, bio, biology science, biologic science and the horticulture science. So we learned a lot of uh, uh, knowledge on the biodiversity. I'm hopeful that this event of today will contribute to defining the role of food and agriculture in post-2020 global biodiversity framework. Biodiversity is essential for food diversity and food security, especially people from a subtropical region. It's in the world. Eh? Subtropical region is the most uh, biodiversity uh, zoom in the world or ecosystem, you can name it. And today's key challenge is twofold. We need to meet the growing demand for food products, food, fiber, feed, and fuel. And of course, at the same time, we need to conserve biodiversity, sustainably manage natural resources, and protect the restore ecosystems. Yesterday, we launched the 
uh, uh, FAO and OECD and crunch outlook for next 10 years. So demand is there, even a little bit slower, but the absolute volume of demand for agri uh, food products, not only the food itself, I said the fiber, feed, and the fuel, biofuel, are uh, dramatically increased. So we cannot do one without the other. The life continue and the environment should be health. That's a challenge. That's why where we are. That's why we depend on the innovation and the, and the technology and, the, and also the collective action. There is no health food without a health environment. It's clear. But how to balance in different countries, different regions, even different communities? And we only the role how to find the real proper role and the rational role of agriculture in sustainable use and the conservation of biodiversity has never been so significant. So agricultural world and the environmental world needed to listen to each other and cooperate. And also others, not only there's two aspects, of course, that's why we want the uh, day one, I come to FAO, I said, we need to more key partners on the board and think on the same page and to, to do coherent the business. Otherwise, this planet is not only belongs to agricultural people or farmers and also uh, our experimental uh, environmental people. No, it's belongs to human being. So all each individuals, uh, units, organizations, you can play your complementary role. That's a clear message. I wanted to build up the friendly, coherent cooperation. That's why I support the uh, uh, UNEP or executive secretary of the UN Convention on the Biodiversity. Not only from point of view of FAODG, and from the global point of view. Eh? And only the cooperation, solidarity, and the single long and bigger and do concrete and then step by step we can change from our own feed from our own step the global dialogues serves exactly that purpose that's why i'm happy to to see so many different key partners come to to speak and to dialogue and then the make a consensus or, or way forward the sustainable use, restoration, conservation, biodiversity contribute to more efficient, inclusive, resilient, and sustainable ecosystems. This is our mission for the future, as reflected by the four batters and the defined FL new strategy framework, better production, better nutrition, a better environment, and a better life. I know some friends always challenge me. Yeah? They say, why we start off better production first? Uh, from uh, some Friends say we start a better environment. Yeah, you have your reason. But if AO names tell you, history tell you, and the basic human rights for this planet is food. So we started with a better production. No matter you are from a developed nation or developed nation, big one or small one, you have to change yourself, improve yourself first. Yeah, you can say best. You have to say better, better every day, every year, every week, or, or, uh, uh, and every corner or every commodities. So better production, better nutrition, that's a two basic human rights. And then, of course, better environment, big or small, uh, micro environment, agro environment, or huge global environment, and then better life. Better life is a livelihood first. You have enough basic, uh, 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 energy requirement from a stab food, starch, and then you have uh, so many different uh, food diversity, added uh, 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 trace ele uh, element or other uh, uh, small element, and then highest requirement for our people, human beings, is a bad quality of life. Bad quality of life started with children, infant, to the middle ages, 
and to the senior ages. That's, we are life scientists. We should look at the whole range of your development and your growth and the whole life cycle should be high quality of life. That's really challenging, not only for FAO, for WHO, for all the relevant uh, key partners in the world and the private sector as well, and the farmers, consumers, yourself. That's why I come to four better. So I think that is the in, interconnect, interdependent issues, not only uh, 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 production and nutrition, and also environment, social, economic, uh, and the environment, and also the, uh, 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 not only materialism, and also spiritualism. We are human beings, we are in, intelligent people. Uh, anymore. We are not only uh, uh, satisfied, happy with uh, materialism, but also they are happy with our own uh, uh, health of uh, specialism. Yeah, that's why we have different uh, religions, different thinking, different philosophy of life. That makes a human being different from other animals. So I think so we say the uh, economic, social environment, and I should say we need another special uh, aspect. So four aspects should be interconnected. FAO has taken bold step on the biodiversity. Our members adopted a strategy on mainstreaming biodiversity across agricultural sectors and the 2021 to 2023 action plan to implement. I think the Samaritan and her team make a lot of efforts on that. I appreciate their uh, contribution and also appreciate the members to, to have uh, uh, agree with a little bit disagree. But we should take action because it's action plan. FAO support a large biodiversity portfolio, more than 800 FAO projects, invest more than 2 billion US dollars, <laughs> including the biodiversity, as a key objective. Dear colleagues, the global pandemic is a stark reminder of how connected we are. We depend on each other as a global community. We collectively depend on nature. The nature is natural. We couldn't change it, but we have to respect and protect it. In 2021, we are at a critical juncture. In this super year of nature, we must collectively scale up our ambitious, coordinations, actions for biodiversity. The UN Dex of Action on Nutrition, Family Farmer, Ecosystem Restoration, together with the negotiation of post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework and upcoming UN Food Summit are the, all the opportunity to shift our path toward the sustainability and the prosperity. We need the prosperity. Without the prosperity, how can keep our human being more civilized and more evolution? So uh, FO is committed to work with the partners to support the sustainable transformation of our agro-food system from production to the consumption, from the individual to the uh, collective, and also from a food loss to the food waste. You name it. We do this, use the modern scientific approach, big data and the and digital application. However, biodiversity mainstream will not take place without the world family farmers, indigenous people, small scale producers, fish flock, livestock keepers, and the foresters. They are real in situ conservation of biodiversity because they make the production more diversity and at the same time is in situ. Huh? N-S-I-T-U. I know some not expert could understand the in situ conservation. You see, we have a, 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 a in vitro conservation. It's a very small proportion. Even we have so many gene banks around the world, but the in situ conservation is a real life conservation. And that's we can get all the farmers and the consumers and the civil society, academy people together. Their knowledge, their tradition, their best practices and the innovations are essential. We must listen to them and work 
and also empower them, believe, trust them, and work with them to ensure that no one is left behind. During this global dialogue, we were listening to the speakers from different background sectors, regions, and the stakeholders, groups. I encourage my FO colleagues, open your mind, learning from other people, even they are so critical, yeah? And they change our mind and to be more inclusive. That's a way to build our FAO more agile, more efficient, more effective to the members, and also more deliverable to the ground farmers and the member countries and all the agricultural sectors. Their diverse experience will enrich our dialogue on the role of food and agriculture in the post-2020 global battle framework. I wish you have a productive meeting and make your hot dialogue at the convention. Even during summer, we are talking about the air conditioning. We don't need your cooling down. Now it's time for your heating yourself and to make a hot dialogue. Thank you, over to you, Sevedo. Thank you, Director General, and thank you for highlighting the critical role of biodiversity in achieving more efficient, inclusive, resilient, and sustainable agri-food system. And reminding us that this only can be done when the different sectors commit to work together and complementing each other. Also that we need innovation, technology, and collective action and be inclusive in this process. It's now my pleasure to welcome Executive Secretary of the Convention on Biodiversity, Elizabeth Maruma Mrema. Elizabeth, my dear friend, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Maria Elena Semedo. It's a pleasure to join you and join all others in this global dialogue. Let me begin first to uh, honor Honorable Dr. Chu Dong Yu, Director General of FAO and Ag <laughs> FAO of the United Nations. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, thank you, uh, Dr. Chu, for inviting me to deliver this message. I also wish to thank all FAO colleagues who have done an excellent job in organizing this meeting uh, in collaboration with my colleagues. It is an honor to speak to you today during this global dialogue on the role of food and agriculture in the global biodiversity framework currently under development. This year's dialogue will build on the successful multi-stakeholder dialogue on biodiversity mainstreaming across agricultural sector, sectors organized also by FAO way back in 2018, which delivered important recommendations for mainstreaming biodiversity in agricultural sectors. This is an important opportunity to reinforce the vital role all components of biological diversity play in supporting production, as well as the vital role of food systems in conserving and sustainably using biodiversity. In this, we conclude not only the rich diversity of crops, livestock, fish, and wild species that nourish but all the species in and landscape fill the vital functions that keep our ecosystems productive and healthy. Elizabeth. Elizabeth. I think you are having technical problems. Maybe they can turn off the, uh, the video. video. Elizabeth, yeah. can you please turn off your video? On biodiversity. Now, while in, I can hear. 
Yeah. Yes. You know? Now it's yeah. better. You can hear? Yeah, yes. yeah. Oh, apologies. That's okay. It's a broad bubble. Please go ahead. Okay, I will go back probably a few sentences. In this, we include not only the rich diversity of crops, livestock, fish, and wild species that nourish us, but all the species in between that inhabit our production landscapes and fulfill the vital functions that keep our ecosystems productive and healthy. The UN decade on biodiversity has now come to an end. Unfortunately, while important progress was made for many of the IH biodiversity targets, none were fully met. The share of overfished marine fish stocks grew, now totaling a third of global stocks. Many fisheries are still causing unsustainable levels of bycatch of non-target species and are damaging marine habitats, which is that is under Aichi target six. Aichi target seven, food production remains among the main drivers of global biodiversity. This can be explained in part by the fact that over the past decade, the users of fertilizers and pesticides has stabilized globally at unsustainably high levels. In addition, the value of government incentives and subsidies to agriculture that are potentially most harmful to the environment have remained well above $100 billion against IHE target three. We are paying richly to harm biodiversity. However, over the last decade, we have also seen proof that sustainably managed production systems can support and enhance biodiversity. Where good fisheries management policies have been introduced, the abundance of marine fish stocks has been maintained or rebuilt. Notably, successes have been achieved recently in reducing overfishing by addressing illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing. In addition, approximately 29% of all farms worldwide are practicing sustainable intensification. In the last decade, the area of land under organic agriculture and the number of organic producers has both doubled. Many countries and regional blocks have also introduced positive incentives to encourage conservation and sustainable use of agriculture through agri-environment schemes. Over the past 10 years, we have learned many valuable lessons and we must make sure to use them as we move go forward and develop the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. To be successful, the framework must address both the direct and indirect drivers of biodiversity loss, including through integrated and holistic approaches to planning and implementation. The integration of gender, the role of indigenous peoples and local communities, and the level of stakeholder engagement will be critical. Although production systems are one of the biggest drivers of biodiversity loss, when managed sustainably, they are also one of the most important levers of sustainable using and conserving biodiversity. We need to adopt agricultural methods that can meet growing global demands while imposing fewer negative impacts on the environment. We need to do this while also reducing the pressure to convert more land to production if we want to bend the curve of biodiversity loss. The Convention on Biological Diversity has just concluded its subsidiary body meetings, which took place between 3rd May to 13th June of this year. During these six weeks, we have had a chance to hear parties' views on the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. 
a number of gaps in the framework were identified, many of which relate to agricultural sector. In particular, parties recognize that issues that affect fisheries, soil biodiversity, genetic diversity, and food systems, among others, need to be better addressed in the framework. Based on these views, the co-chairs of the open-ended working group are now preparing a first draft of the framework, which will be available in advance of the working group's third meeting to be held between 23rd August and 3rd September of this year. As we await this first draft, and as preparations continue for the 15th conference of the parties to the convention, today's dialogue is a unique opportunity to engage all food system actors in a meaningful discussions around how the global biodiversity framework can promote sustainable and biodiverse production systems. We know that many important species globally are under threat due to unsustainable practices such as deforestation, overharvesting, landscape simplification, and misuse of inputs. These threats ultimately undermine the long-term productivity of our food system. Yet, we also know that investing biodiversity can yield incomes and resilience, helping us achieve a more sustainable and food secure future. So what is stopping us from making the changes we need? Today, we need to hear from you on how the global biodiversity framework can address lock-ins and ensure that production systems protect and benefit from biodiversity rather than harming it. Ladies and gentlemen, let me finish by reminding us that this is a critical decade. As countries continue to hit new hit records, as the ongoing pandemic continues to take its toll, and as vital species habitat continues to burn, there is simply no time left to waste on convenience, but temporary solutions. The time for systemic transformative change is now. We must engage the agricultural sector in the development and implementation of the global biodiversity framework. Without them, we will simply not reach our biodiversity goals. The post-2020 global biodiversity framework will be an indispensable pillar of the international architecture to support the transformations needed for our food systems to ensure improved food security, environmental sustainability, and achievement of sustainable development goals. The new framework is an opportunity to bring together actors, stakeholders, and rights holders in building the resilience we need in the face of the growing environmental health and development challenges facing our food systems. I invite you to help us ensure that the 15th conference of the parties to the convention becomes a turning point, helping to create food systems that deliver prosperity for people and for planet and for the many generations to come. Thank you very much. Back to you, Maria Elena. Thank you very much, uh, Elizabeth, uh, for emphasizing the crucial need for biodiversity mainstreaming across the agriculture, forestry, and fisheries sector, both in practices and policies. You stress the vital role of the food system on sustainably using biodiversity and keeping our ecosystem healthy and active but also reminding us that our production system needs to protect and benefit from biodiversity. And we need to support the transformation of agri-food systems in a way that they can bring prosperity for people and for the planet. Uh, thank you very much to you and the Director General for your inspiring words. Ladies and gentlemen, 
This concludes the official opening of the global dialogue. Uh, I would like again to thank our keynote speakers for their inspiring words that sets the tone for our discussion with a focus on food and agriculture in the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. In the next two days, we'll be here from a broad range of stakeholders to share how they are working to mainstream biodiversity across the agriculture sectors. Tomorrow, during the high level segment, we'll present a summary of the discussion to ministers of and heads of the United Nations agencies. And these uh, recommendations from this two days discussion will provide us our guidance to contribute to the discussion of the post 2020 global biodiversity framework. With this, now let me pass the floor to the co-chairs of our first session. We have Ambassador Tanawat Tenson of Thailand. He is connected from Thailand. Thank you, Ambassador, for joining us. And Ambassador Marie Therese Sartre of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. They will be facilitating the first session in this morning. Uh, thank you all again for joining us and I wish you all a successful meeting. Co-chairs, over to you. Thank you very much, Maria Helena. Um, and alongside Tanawat, I'm very much looking forward to co-chairing this morning's discussion. Um, thank you also, Director General and Executive Secretary for your opening uh, speeches. Distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, I'm sure that you share my disappointment that we're not able to meet in person as usual in Rome, but I'm thankful that technology allows us to organize this important uh, dialogue online and thus accomplish our work while we look forward to our next uh, potential meetings in, in person. As FAO Director General Chu and the Executive Secretary of the CBD have mentioned, the objective of this global dialogue is to provide a forum to highlight the role and facilitate the engagement of the food and agriculture sectors in the post 2020 global biodiversity framework. We, the co-chairs of today's session, will prepare a co-chairs report summarizing our discussions and we'll present that tomorrow at the high level segment as an input to the ministers and heads of agencies deliberations. The high level segment tomorrow will bring together representatives from all relevant sectors, including environment, agriculture, forestry and fisheries to consider our conclusions from today. The conclusions of our dialogue and the outcome of the high level segment will feed into the ongoing CBD negotiations of the post 2020 global biodiversity framework and indeed the food system summit and its preparatory process. Ladies and gentlemen, before moving on to our first speakers, allow me to make a, a few brief announcements regarding the technical arrangements. Um, this meeting is being recorded and uh, the recording will be published on FAO's website after the event. And we encourage you to rename yourself in Zoom uh, to include your name as well as uh, the organization and this, uh, your, the organization you're representing and this will make it much easier to identify who's asking which questions. Um, as you may have already noticed, interpretation is available in all six official languages of the United Nations, and it can be uh, selected at the bottom of your screen. Um, as this is a global dialogue, um, we really much, uh, we're very much looking forward to your participation, but because we, there are so many of us, uh, 1200 participants have registered so far, um, we're going to conduct the question and answers and discussion through the Zoom Q&A function. So please will you submit any questions that you have uh, for the panelists using the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. After each uh, block of speaker interventions, we're going to pause and we will select uh, some of the questions uh, and put these to the participants in order to uh, generate the discussion. And I'm very much looking forward to that. Um, 
if your question is selected, you'll be notified beforehand using Zoom's chat function. So please do attend, uh, pay attention to any messages in the chat in the chat function. Uh, and please uh, note, in the interest of time and ensuring that as many people as possible can participate in the dialogue, please keep your questions as short as possible. We've also uh, prepared a series of poll questions throughout the day, just to ensure that it's a truly interactive event. Uh, and the questions will be testing our knowledge on key facts and figures and get us thinking. Um, and we'll uh, have some of those poll questions after each uh, block of speakers. So today's first session, indeed, and the session that I'm uh, co-chairing with my uh, colleague Tanawat Tensen from uh, Thailand, will, is going to focus on meeting people's needs through sustainable use of biodiversity. We have an exciting program, including nine distinguished speakers, each champions of biodiversity and sustainable development in their respective sectors. And uh, just before we get started, I'd just like to ask the speakers if they would keep to the time that's been allocated, um, because this will, of course, allow uh, plenty of time for questions and answers and discussion. Um, and I, I am going to be strict, as colleagues know, I can be quite strict about timing. Um, so uh, just to uh, warn you. Anyway, let me move on to our first, first keynote speaker, Gerda Verberg. Ms. Verberg is the UN Assistant Secretary General and the coordinator of the Scaling Up Nutrition Movement. Ms. Ber Verberg will speak about the connections between biodiversity and food and nutrition. Um, Ms. Verberg, you have the floor for 10 minutes. Uh, over to you, I'm looking forward to hearing from you. We can't hear you, please take yourself off mute. Thanks. Thank you, Madam Co-Chair. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it is so good that the um, organizers of this event have brought the interest of our planet and our people together to think about biodiversity and about quality of uh, food and enough food and nutrition. So um, it's an exciting year, but you are making the best out of it by organizing this event because this is a super year for nature with the COP26 uh, and the CBD COP15 ahead, as well as the fifth United Nations Environment Assembly, um, the launch of the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration and the United Nations Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development, and I believe much more. At the same time, so this is on the planetary uh, health, but also on the people's health and uh, nourishment. This is a key year for people since this is the year of action on uh, nutrition, but it's also the year of the food system summit that will be um, hosted um, when it comes to the pre-summit by the Rome-based agencies, FAO, WFP and uh, IFAD. And when it comes to um, uh, the summit by the UN Secretary, Secretary, Secretary General. But it's also the year of nutrition for growth that will be hosted by the uh, government of Japan connected to the Olympic Games. So there are opportunities and it is more than necessary to bring the agendas of the interest of uh, people and the planet together not only in high level events, but also when it comes to practice. And let me be clear about this, because the current situation is that our food system, as we uh, know it today, is bankrupting our health systems in all countries. Um, more than 80% of all diseases are food related. Too little, too much, too much sugar, fat, salt, um, too little uh, uh, diverse, anemia, uh, but also undernutrition when it comes to children, stunting, wasting, not giving children the opportunity to develop their talents, their potential talents uh, physically, but also when it comes to the cognitive development. So this is what is happening right now. Our current food system is bankrupting our health system, but at the same time, it is exhausting 
our biodiversity and our uh, planet. And for that reason, we need to join forces. I'm sitting in the nutrition agenda and the only solution is if we are really working hand in hand to find uh, solutions that are serving people and the planet alike. Um, what needs to be done? I think um, it is to start with the things that um, we can reverse. For instance, um, many people think that we need to produce more to feed and nourish 10 billion people by 2050. It's not 2050, it is not the case. Uh, because we are already producing enough to nourish uh, people in a way. And the miracle has happened that in the last 50 years, our ability to produce food has gone up by nearly 300%, thanks to our incredible ability to innovate. However, there is also a flip side to this because we have done, done this at the cost of our natural resources, our water uh, resources, our biodiversity, our um, genetic uh, diversity. Um, and we are wasting a hell of a lot of food. Did you know that 35% uh, of all the food we produce equivalent to a loss of um, uh, um, uh, 960, uh, uh, 36 billion annually, 936 billion dollars annually um, is lost or wasted. So if we would be able to prevent food loss and waste by uh, um, of this one third of all produced food, think about how many more people we could nourish, how uh, much less emissions uh, we would have and how much biodiversity we could restore or preserve. So I would like to um, uh, start to, uh, to ask the question how to do this because I think the agenda setting is not the biggest problem. It requires a shift in mindset. Not only one, it requires many shifts in mindset because whatever happens, the future of people is uh, the future of our planet and our people is in the hand of people, still in the hand of people. So we need to rethink the way we, what we are doing. We need to rethink from feed the world to healthy, nourish people and build resilient communities. And let me give um, some examples here. We don't need to produce more we need to produce smarter. We don't need to think quantity anymore, but quality. We need to think from uh, poverty, how do we fight poverty towards how do we provide food producers, farmers, uh, uh, including women and young people? How do we provide them a decent income? We need to stop thinking about calories, filling the bellies. We need to think about nourishing people, good nutrition, tasty, healthy food. And we need to um, uh, um, pay farmers for ecosystem services, which is not included right now. So many farmers are already doing what they can because if they don't, uh, if they are not a steward, to uh, the natural resources, they will not be able to produce anyhow in the future. So it's in their own interest, but we as consumers, we as urban areas, we as uh, people who want to also leave a better, leave this world a better place to our next generation need to be ready to reward farmers for what they are doing for our uh, ecosystem. And I think, uh, Madam Co-Chair, it's about time that we uh, become serious about gender equality. Because gender equality is one of the uh, biggest things to hear when it comes to food production, agriculture, but also when it comes to nourishing our planet. Gen women very often have no access, no legal um, uh, position when it comes to uh, ownership, tenure, uh, financial services, legal services, 
Um, and this has to end. Let us also agree to stop this gender inequality. Um, it's so, and it can start with innovation, just like we have uh, uh, innovated our food systems uh, uh, over the past 50 years, we need to innovate our food system, food system right now. Not by producing more, but making new technologies uh, user-friendly and also applicable in the rural area, making sure that women have equal access compared to men. So, and finally, um, we're talking a lot about youth these times. Let me be very frank with you. Youth doesn't need to be heard alone. They need to be at the table to discuss um, and to co-make decisions. And young people um, uh, uh, that are around the table right now are the decision makers for, of tomorrow. So don't treat them as young youngsters that are allowed to be at the table, but take them serious in all phases of decision making and uh, implementing. Finally, because um, I'm looking at the time, what do I hope to see as an outcome of the CBD COP? Um, and I have, I have seven wishes here that I would like to see uh, reflected in the framework that you are gonna, uh, gonna develop. Um, one is the overarching issue, equality for gender and youth. The second point is um, the, the support and the stimulation of multidisciplinary disciplinary, uh, research and science. The third is um, rewarding those people, farmers, producers, but also consumers, um, uh, if they do well. So redirect the 600 billion uh, agricultural subsidies to catalyze nourishing people and planet. Don't cut them, but redirect them to support and catalyze what we want to see uh, done better. The fourth is a clearinghouse mechanism for funding. Don't go only for funding for biodiversity or funding for food and nutrition. Combine them so that you can incentivize people to also uh, combine this agenda. My fifth uh, uh, point is leave dogmas, egos and logos at the door and step out of your comfort zone, zone because only if we are all uh, uh, ready to step out of our comfort zone and work with people we uh, haven't even learned to know until now, um, we will be able to find new solutions and we know the old solutions don't work anymore. And my seventh and final point is if by working together with the unexpected uh, on planetary health and uh, human health, with all different uh, stakeholders, we will be not only able to improve the food systems, but we will catalyze the implementation of all 17 sustainable development goals. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, for having me. Gerda Verberg, thank you very much for your keynote speech. And thank you so much for highlighting all the opportunities we have this year to bring people and planet together and uh, to forge a sustainable way forward. We have, of course, as you've said, the Food System Summit, COP26, as well as COP15. Um, I would now like to um, hand in just one moment, I'm going to hand over to my co-chair, um, his Excellency Tanawat Tinsin. But just before I do, I just wanted to absolutely echo your point about young people. We're very keen to hear from young people. And indeed, if you're young and listening to the dialogue today, please say so when you answer a question. That would be uh, really helpful for us uh, when we're moderating the discussion to know uh, which young people are asking which questions. Thank you. And with that, please let me hand over to His Excellency Ambassador Tanawat Tenseng, who's going to uh, chair the first part of our discussion this morning. Over to you, Tanawat. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Terry. Uh, good afternoon from Bangkok and you know, good morning uh, in Rome and elsewhere. And as we have heard from Gerda uh, mentioned earlier, together we can make things better. And that's why our well being. Uh, is highly dependent on biodiversity. And that's why if we want to achieve the food securities and improve nutrition, we need to make sure that we can save, we can conserve uh, our biodiversity for next generations. And this morning we have uh, others uh, speakers who will join us. 
uh, we will start with the first speakers, uh, Julia Farr. Uh, she is a professor of biodiversity and human development uh, from Manchester Metropolitan Universities of the United Kingdom. First, I would like to give the floor to Professor Julia Farr, please. Thank you very much, and thank you now to everyone. Um, I've got to apologize because I am um, actually in a cafeteria uh, on my way to the airport. I've been stuck in southern Spain, which is not a very bad place to be in, uh, but it's also hot. Um, so maybe you can smell the coffee in the background and, and the nice Spanish bread and so on. Can, can you see the background? Can you see the slides? Yeah, we can see your slide. Yeah. <laughs> Lovely. Yep. <clears throat> and what I want to do in five minutes is actually give you a very broad understanding of issues related to sustainable wildlife management. What we mean by that is that we have to come up with better ways of using biodiversity as a source of food, and of course, many other different products come out of wildlife. But in this particular um, uh, session, we are going to talk about the wild meat, the, the food, the meat, the flesh that comes out of animals. And we're dealing with a very wide variety of animals that obviously make up biodiversity. Well, I am going to concentrate primarily on vertebrates because those are the ones that actually produce most of the food that people um, uh, consume throughout the world. And I'm going to focus also on tropics and subtropics. Of course, wild meats and wild foods are eaten throughout the world, but we know that there is a particular demand because of large numbers of people that do survive from biodiversity, they can eat and want to eat. So when we talk about sustainable wildlife management, according to the Convention of Biological Diversity, we're dealing with the sound management of wildlife species so that we can sustain, sustain their population and habitat over time while considering the socioeconomic needs of human populations. Sustainable wildlife management is a very broad topic in many ways. It's a topic that we, through the leadership of the FAO and the EU Sustainable Wildlife Program that we will lead, we are going to make uh, certain changes for the better in how people are using wild meat in different parts of the world. So let me start by saying, when we talk about wild meat, we're really talking about bush meat. The thing is that bush meat is very much associated with Africa and in other parts of the world. And you know, the feeling is, and certainly this was very much expressed in the CBD in 2017 when I went over to Montreal, that maybe we should use a more generic term to deal with animals that we are consuming throughout the world. If you look at um, the variety of species that are eaten by people, that are needed by people, we have about more than 2,000 animal species consumed worldwide. But in terms of vertebrates, we have about 600 vertebrate species that are very much the mainstay of what people are consuming. And out of those, mammals make up a very large proportion of the meat that are being consumed in the tropics and subtropics. We know that more than 50% of the protein intake in many communities worldwide in the tropics and subtropics actually rely on this meat for food security. We know it's a cultural practice, hunting animals and food is a cultural practice that we must understand and join with them so that we have a better understanding of how people are using wild meat. But we also know that there is a huge impact of uncontrolled hunting. This is give you some basic facts, about 10 million tons per year of mammal meat only are being consumed in the tropics. That's from our calculations and all that. We know there's been population declines in these species up to 90%. And a very large number of mammal species, according to Ripple and others, are now threatened with extinction. So our concern are threefold. We need to understand the use of wild meat because of the ecological impact of re removing animals from ecosystems. 
It poses a real threat to many wildlife species and indeed to the ecosystems in which they are found. Of course, food security and nutrition. All of these animals provide many, many millions of people with enough food and food security and livelihood. But we must also take into account the health and zoonotic diseases that are also associated with the consumption of bush meat or wild meat. We need to understand productivity of these ecosystems because they differ. Just to give you a very broad idea, there's much more uh, wild meat, if you want, in savanna areas than in tropical forests. And wild meat is vitally important in the diets of people because of not just protein, but because of vitamin C, iron, and the zinc, and other things that are found. But if you think about it, if we were to eliminate and not sustainably use wildlife in the Congo Basin, for example, where we estimate about 5 million um, you know, tons of meat are consumed every, every year, we would have to produce about 15 million cows or 2 billion chickens in order to supply that food. And this is just an understanding that we need to have and make sure that these global plans for sustainable consumption are actually put in place. So we need to protect the game species, to promote food security, protect threatened species, and indeed go beyond that manage and improve the sustainability of wild meat supply, reduce the demand for unsustainably managed wild meat, and indeed create enabling conditions for controlled, sustainable wildlife sector. And indeed, through the CCD, we produce a very sort of comprehensive document on how that can be achieved. And essentially, we need to integrate conservation and sustainable use, we need to make sure that the use of biological resources avoid and minimize adverse impacts. We need to protect and encourage customary use of biological resources, support local populations, and indeed encourage government authorities and the private sector to collaborate, to develop methods and of sustainable use of biological resources. Unless we do all this, we are not going to have a well-nourished number of people, millions of people throughout the world, and also we will lose biodiversity if we don't do this. Thank you very much. I hope it was five minutes. Thank you very much, Julia. I think you did a great job uh, within uh, five minutes, and also uh, thank you very much for your comprehensive uh, uh, presentation that we need a specific solution for a specific uh, situation. Thank you very much. Uh, next, I would like to ask uh, Fang Sua Pitu, the special envoys for international sustainable agricultures uh, from Federal Office of Agricultures from Switzerland uh, to join us. He would talk on uh, the role of genetics resources for food and agriculture. Fang Sua, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, uh, Chair, uh, Director General, uh, distinguished delegate, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, good day to all of you from uh, Switzerland. Uh, first, I would like to thank FAO and the Secretariat of the CBD for the organization and the invitation to contribute to this global dialogue. As mentioned by Maria Elena Semedo, the, the timing is perfect with the pre-UN summit on food system in three weeks and the final round of negotiation on the post-2020 global strategy on biodiversity at the end of August. Overall objectives are common, speed up, speed up global, local, and people actions to achieve the SDGs by 2030. As the main user of terrestrial ecosystem and because of their overall high dependence on biodiversity, agriculture and food are part of the problem, but at the same time, a key element of the solution. Genetic resources for food and agriculture are the basis of all food production. They have been created and maintained by people over millennia. Attention on biodiversity and on food systems has never been higher, and it has never been clearer 
that transforming food systems towards more sustainability is critical, not only for food security and nutrition and human health, but also to reverse biodiversity loss and address climate change. Switzerland is very active to bring biodiversity, agriculture, and food systems together. With Costa Rica, WWF and CGIRR, we launch a multi-stakeholder dialogue to develop concrete target proposals to better address food systems transformation in the new global biodiversity framework. Biodiversity is indeed key for this transformation through sustainable use of its components, in particular genetic resources for food and agriculture. Let me emphasize the two following key priorities and how to achieve it. First, on conservation goal, like highlighted by Elisabeth Maruma, we shall reduce the direct threats from conventional agriculture to biodiversity, such as reducing the environmental risk from pesticides and excess nutrients and developing land saving approaches based on increased resource efficiency. To achieve this, Access to a large pool of genetic resources for food and agriculture is essential, for example, for breeding locally adapted pest resistant varieties. Second, on the sustainable use goal, we need ecological intensification of agriculture and food systems. This means promotion of productive solutions and approaches based on the sustainable use of biodiversity for example, by promoting agroecological approaches. This requires, again, broad genetic resources diversity for locally adapted plant and animal breeding, but also from associated insects and microorganisms for biological pest control, pollination, or improved soil health and fertility. Concretely, this could be achieved in the GBF First, on conservation, by better reflecting current Aishi Target 13 to stop ongoing erosion of genetic resources for food and agriculture, and also better recognizing the contribution of human managed ecosystem in the conservation of biodiversity. Secondly, on sustainable use, by setting a clear food system transformation target on increasing productive areas on the sustainable use of biodiversity in human managed ecosystems. Ladies and gentlemen, involvement and reconnection of all actors along the food value chain, including all of us as citizens and consumers is key, as well as setting the right incentives for producers. A special focus in, is needed on ensuring fair income and livelihood of family farmers recognizing the, their long-term engagements as custodian, but also creator of biodiversity and genetic resources. This will require additional efforts on awareness raising, education, research, innovation, and resource mobilization. But also very important, it requires the development of an international reference framework for the measurement of the sustainable footprint of food and agriculture systems with recognized criteria and indicators on biodiversity. FAO has a critical role to play to facilitate this process as custodian of SDG indicator 2.41. Such a system will help farmers to assess their performance, governments to assess impact of public policies, and last but not least, consumers to make informed choice. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to emphasize the critical importance of the Global Plan of Action on Biodiversity for Food and Agriculture, currently under negotiation within the FAO Commission on Genetic Resources, as the reference tool to support implementation of the GBF in the food and agricultural sector, including through the FAO strategy on biodiversity. Today, we have a unique window of opportunity for ensuring the essential cross-feeding between food and agriculture and nature and environment sectors, not only regarding content, but also for convergence in the follow-up process, building on existing initiatives and mechanisms. 
in other words, mutually supportiveness to achieve the vision of living in harmony with nature. This means transformation of agriculture and food system for biodiversity, but even equally important by biodiversity. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, uh, Francois, for your great uh, interventions. And as all of us know that securing the sustainable use and conservation of biodiversity is the duties of each of, uh, at each of us. And also we need to work uh, in holistic approach to make sure that we can bring the issues of biodiversity, bio, um, uh, uh, food securities and food system together. Thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, next uh, speakers is uh, Tony uh, Simon. Uh, Tony Simon is the executive director of uh, C4 uh, and he, was, uh, he would talk uh, on uh, forest trees outside forest by all diversities and people. Now the floor is yours, Simon. Thank you very much, Honorable uh, Tana Watsensen and also co-chair Terry uh, Sarch. Um, could I have the first slide, please? Great, thanks very much for that. Um, isn't it amazing that agriculture has been around for 10,000 years, but the word biodiversity has only existed for 33 years. Um, that's not to say that biodiversity has not been important to agriculture previously, but it, it's more likely a reflection that we didn't realize its importance. And the post 2020 biodiversity framework gives us that opportunity to put that neglect of biodiversity to rest. Forests cover 30% of our land, make up 5% of our described species, and contribute only 1.5% to global GDP. But amazingly, forests house 85% of terrestrial biodiversity. And moreover, they provide the physical framework, the architecture, for much of other terrestrial life to flourish, including, including humans. We ourselves are a, we're a forest derived organism. We ourselves came from forest cultures. Um, but overall forests like biodiversity are assigned relatively low levels of importance at international level. And, and that's what needs to change. Could I have the next slide please? Perhaps the main misunderstanding and an underappreciation of the role of biodiversity in agriculture is this incorrect framing. Um, just one click, please. Great, thanks. Agriculture is seen, about, seen as being about people and food, and all of the important aspects are to be found in sustainable development goal number two. And whilst we now speak of regenerative agriculture, the truth is that mo most of our agriculture is degenerative. As crops grown with high external outputs, no regard for the negative externalities that they generate. And biodiversity is seen as being all about that non-agrarian land use, uh, about wilderness habitats and conservation concerns. So one more click, please. So this is the framing that we need to change. And most of the post-2020 framework gives us that. And sorry, the post-2020 framework gives us that opportunity. It is about connecting land uses, land users, and land resources. And we need to, to better understand the individual contribution to livelihoods and ecosystem integrity, but also their ability to contribute and synergize with agricultural objectives. Next slide, please. One of the reasons quoted for, for the persistence of degenerative agricultural practices is the absence of of information, um, absence of, of options for biodiversity-based solutions and, and more regenerative practices in land use. Now, that may have been true 33 years ago, but it's certainly not true today. Trees and forests are the most ready and most sensible options in many locations, and FAO, CBD, and as well as C4 aircraft and others 
now have amazing knowledge resources freely available to all to use. And these are databases, apps, guidelines, analyses, uh, and other tools. And we share a few readily accessible resources here. Next slide, please. Now, likely little is going to change in the post-2020 global framework unless we change partnerships. We need stronger partnerships and the connections between agriculture and biodiversity. And we applaud both FAO and CBD for convening this dialogue. There are other exciting initiatives underway, such as the G20 initiative on land degradation as well. But we need to see that wider institutional partnerships include more voice and more contribution from civil society and private sector. And here, the, the well-established Global Landscape Forum and the new private sector and private um, investor-facing entity called Resilient Landscapes is helping to boost such partnerships. Two weeks ago, the um, Chinese Academy of Science, the Chinese Academy of Forests, the Chinese Academy of Agricultural Science, and the Kunming Institute of Botany, along with the Forest Trees and Agroforestry Program, convene a much needed partners meeting in Beijing to, to help conceive a new ambitious and impactful partnership on forests and trees. And a key part of that was a new offering framed around biodiversity. Um, and the key benefits derived to nature and humans from it, recalling that it is forests that house 85% of global terrestrial biodiversity. Please do check out the meeting summary um, shown here. So in closing, um, co-chair, um, let us remember that aside from being a reservoir of living potential, nothing is better than biodiversity at providing healthy agroecosystems. Nothing is better than allowing adaptation to climate change. Nothing is better than biodiversity about giving diversification options and reducing soil erosion, as well as enhancing soil carbon, increasing water hold capacity of the land, and it boosting total productivity. So looking forward in the next decade, we will need to protect and deploy all three levels of biodiversity, which were equally important to agriculture, to nature, to forests, uh, trees, and people. The intraspecific genetic diversity that Francois spoke about, the interspecific diversity, and the ecosystem diversity. But surely whatever else we do, we need to lay down a clear market in this new biodiversity framework, that there is no such thing as net zero when it comes to biodiversity loss. And biodiversity is too important to offset losses in one setting to gains in another. And sadly, that's what we're doing in agriculture at the moment. Thanks very much for listening. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Tony, for your interesting uh, presentation. I think all of us agree that uh, biodiversity continue to be eroded. And also we have seen deforestation everywhere around the world. And that's why, uh, biodiversity, if we want to make sure that biodiversity can provide a healthy ecosystem, all of us need to take an action. Uh, actually, we have another uh, present, um, intervention from Arajandro uh, Barrios, but unfortunately, he could not join us today. And that's why uh, I will prefer I would like to take this opportunity to have uh, the open discussion uh, between uh, participations, uh, participants and also with our speakers. And if you would like to uh, take the floor to ask questions or even uh, if you, some of you already uh, write the questions on the Q and A, uh, we will also uh, take some of the questions and ask to our speakers. Since now my co-chair, uh, Ambassador Terry Sack, uh, is here, perhaps we can also join our task uh, to make sure that we can entertain our uh, audience and also entertain our uh, speakers with interesting questions to make sure that during next uh, 30 minutes, we can have a great uh, discussion among us. Uh, Therese, perhaps you have some question, please. So Tanawat, thank you. I think before we move on to the questions, we have a poll to test everyone's oh, yeah, knowledge. Right. You're right. 
Um, yep, yes. Did you want to take everyone through the poll? Uh, and here it is coming up on the screen. Oh, back yeah. over to you, Tanawa. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have the poll that you can see the first question, smallholders are important custodian of biodiversities, 84% of 808 million farms have less than two hectares. How much the uh, global agricultures and land do they manage? Perhaps you can choose, uh, they have some choice there. You can click and give us your answers. And the next question is the indigenous people uh, constitute only 5% of the world population. What shares or protected area do they manage? Because we want to get your idea. We want to make sure that you are aware of the issues because sometimes we always say that small holders are very important in uh, saving our biodiversities and indigenous people around the world also play an important role. And that's why you, we have to make sure that you are really aware of the issues. If you finish um, give your, uh, giving your answers, perhaps our secretariat can, after this, we can show the result of the poll. And co-chair, don't forget to give the answer as well. <laughs> Wow, excellent. You Here can are the see answers. That. Yeah, please. Yeah, it's absolutely 70% uh, of the, the answers are, are say that uh, I think majorities, uh, I think 70% uh, of the global agricultural land yeah, is there. And also the indigenous people are, yeah, I think majorities of the answer is around 60%, 40%, and 20%. Uh, my co-chair, you have uh, uh, the, the good answers uh, to, to this. Perhaps you have the right answers to share with us. So I don't have the right answers right now, Tanawat, but I am relying on the uh, secretariat to tell yeah. us what the right answers are. All right, I think we're going to come back to you with the right answers yeah. in just yeah. a little bit. But in yeah. the meantime, uh, perhaps we should crack on with the discussion. Yeah, sure. Uh, now I would like to open the floor for the questions and comments from the floor. If uh, some of you would like to take the floor, please raise your hand. And also I have some questions that perhaps I can give to our speaker directly as well. Is there anyone who would like to break the ice this uh, morning? So okay, Tanawat, if I may, there was one Please. question from a young person in the audience from Please. South Africa, Please. I think, um, who was asking about what the role is of religious leaders uh, in uh, you know, making progress uh, with biodiversity. Um, uh, and I particularly like to ask that question first because it's from a young person. Please. Um, yeah. So um, perhaps. <laughs> Perhaps members of the panel, um, I, I don't think the question was directed at uh, any one panelist in particular, but perhaps members of the panel would like to uh, take it in turns to respond to that uh, on, yeah. What do I'm you see the to... role of religious? Lovely, yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah. Back Sorry. over to you then, thanks. Yeah, Great, um, a superb question and, and a very deep question with, with, with a lot of um, elements to it. Um, it is communities um, that have stewarded biodiversity since our very existence. Um, even though biodiversity has been around for a very long time, the, the protection, the management, the collection uh, of species assemblages and habitats that we have has, has been driven by humans. Um, a lot of that is, is, is contextually based and, and based on different religions around the world and, and the agroecosystems in which, in which they're derived, but it is a, a very key part. And connecting that re religious theme with the theme of youth um, and the respect for nature and the respect for humans. If, I mean, if we're, if we're not respecting nature, we aren't respecting each other enough either. Um, in my generation, it was all about um, 
physical infrastructure, big dams, big roads, big facilities. And, and what do the youth have to look forward to today with, with all of the issues and the problems around agriculture, biodiversity, climate change, et cetera? And perhaps it is that, that optimism of a new infrastructure, a, a green infrastructure. And so we need to use the, the religious leaders, need to use the, the morals and values and, and, and leaders in society to align our thinking, align our aspirations, align, align what we think are success metrics um, in nature with biodiversity as we seek to, to feed ourselves and, and, and prosper. But a great question, thanks very much. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Tony, for your response. Is there any other speakers who would like to uh, take the floor to respond to these issues about the role of religious leaders? Okay, okay, perhaps we can move to the next uh, questions. Uh, I think it's one of the slide uh, of our speakers also mentioned about the animal protein. And sometimes animal proteins has been blamed a lot about uh, have an impact on biodiversity. The question is what the alternative uh, sources of protein can demand access in, instead of uh, meat or animal protein? Or maybe I can give the floor to uh, uh, François Pitou to respond to this question, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Co-Chair, and thank you for <laughs> giving me the floor on this question. I'm not sure I'm the most, uh, 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 the best person to respond to this question, so I'm sure that Gerda will come to this later on, since yeah, she sure. yeah. <laughs> it's my focus on. But but I I think uh, what is what is uh, this is a, again a, a personal view I think uh, uh, a few uh, centuries ago or even decades ago I think more uh, most of the the population or still today is relying on uh, plant uh, protein based diets and uh, one sign of the of the development in the current decades was. Uh, to move from a uh, uh, plant-based diet uh, to animal protein-based uh, diets. And uh, I think, of course, we see, we see the effect of this uh, uh, transformation of the diet. And uh, what I would like to say, I think we just need to go back to the to common sense and, and really go back to the, to the basics and uh, see, for example, uh, in our own uh, uh, culture, uh, what, what were the, the classical uh, components of the diets, uh, uh, for example, five decades ago, and, and really try to, to bring these, uh, these uh, approach mainly based on uh, plant-based uh, proteins uh, back uh, in our current diets. And, and I think, again, for me, it's always a question of common sense, finding the right balance between uh, plant-based uh, proteins and animal-based proteins. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Fang Su. I give the floor to Gerber to respond to these issues as well, please. Hello. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, and I agree very much. There are innovative uh, uh, sources, but we need to uh, rethink and restore uh, whatever we can. At the same time, we shouldn't uh, uh, forget that we also destroy a lot of uh, proteins by uh, food loss and food waste. And this is something we, um, you and me and all uh, the participants, um, uh, about 430 right now, and all those people who are in the streaming, uh, please have a check in how your, how your own food behavior uh, uh, is and think how you can improve um, uh, food, how you can avoid food waste. Uh, because in the Western world, it is about 20% of all food we buy that we, uh, that we are wasting. At the same time, food losses uh, should be uh, protected because in many African uh, countries, we can see that around harvest, uh, uh, 30 or more percent of the food is, um, is lost because of a lack of um, storage, of uh, processing, uh, etc. So let's continue to uh, look for alternative resources. There are in insects that could be uh, an alternative resource. It is happening already. Um, I think uh, products from the ocean, uh, uh, algae, are.
are a, a product and there are more, but we shouldn't try to uh, consume only more and more, but we should find a smarter solution. Yeah, Thank exactly. You. Yeah. Thank you very much. And that's why we need to change our uh, consumption pattern as well. And mindset. Think yeah, exactly. in a different way. Yeah. yeah. Because yeah, thank you Mr. Very Chair, much. if you allow me, I'm Please. around already for quite some time in the world of, uh, uh, of food and biodiversity. I've been the Minister of Agriculture, Nature and Food Quality in the, the Netherlands. Yeah. Uh, and I've also been the ambassador to the Rome-based agencies. So I know CBD and I know uh, food. What I notice in the Q&As that there are questions over there that are still fighting the fight of yesterday. Yeah. I would like to encourage all uh, uh, question askers, but all uh, uh, decision makers and inspirators, just in, 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 in uh, people who need to inspire, like religious leaders, to think in a different way, to, to lead in changing the mindset, not what is uh, creating the distinction, what is the friction? What is our own thing? Only one thing that we want to drive uh, uh, for, like food sovereignty or agroecology. That is the thing. It's not one size fits all. It is finding solutions that serve community, people, and the biodiversity uh, alike. And it has to differ from region to region or community and country uh, to country. Thanks. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Gerda. And also you missed to mention that you are also the former uh, chairperson of the Committee on World Food Security, CFS. And thank you very much for joining us. Uh, I have another question that I can give to uh, Tony. Uh, what measures or medication method we can take to avoid biodiversity loss uh, in agricultural land near forest area? Do you have any um, idea on this? To share with us? Yes, yes, fantastic question. Um, the measure we need <laughs> is a measure. Um, we need a metric. We need a way of simply addressing biodiversity. Too long we've looked at species richness, just counting the number of species that we have rather than thinking about a, a broader um, index, of, or maybe not even an index, but a, a combination of, of the relative level of biodiversity in the health of those landscapes and those mixed landscapes of, of crop fields, um, agricultural fields with trees in them that mimic forests and, and the forest and protected lands and wetlands around them. So if we only rely on counting numbers of species, we're going to go off on a tangent. And with new um, geospatial techniques now, we can, we can have proxies for the amount of diversity. Of course, it'll be relative. Um, if you're in Burkina Faso in a dry area with 600 millimeters of rainfall, having 50 plant species is an incredibly rich um, agroecosystem. If you're in the Orinoco Valley in, in South America, having 50 plant species is a very impoverished state. So it will be relative. And, you know, there was one question there about working with, with multinationals and some of the chemical companies. We've got to get them moving in the right direction. So we need to, to be able to measure relative amounts of biodiversity cheaply, reliably, in an agreed way from space and combine that with the direction of travel. What is the threat to biodiversity? What is the threat to human health, the threat to livelihoods, the threat to the sustainability of, of agriculture? Because regenerative agriculture is not just about the, the environmental side. It's about regenerating the economy regenerating societies, regenerating human capacities and skills. And if we can have those two combinations of a relative biodiversity measure and connect it with the direction of travel, the risk to biodiversity, that will give us a biodiversity vector. It will give us a way of seeing how things are, 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 are progressing, not only for intact natural uh, systems like forest, but also the related forest agricultural systems as well as the, the pure uh, croplands. It's about that balance and integration that will really move us forward. Yep, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tony, for your uh, response. And also I would like to welcome the newly elected uh, independent chairs of the councils who are joining us now, uh, Ambassador Hans Hukerin, welcome you to this uh, meeting.
Uh, the next question from India, Dr. Tipati. What is the status of animal biodiversity in Europe currently in comparison to what they have 100 years ago? Perhaps I can give the, this uh, uh, question to Francois Pitou, who is the chairperson of uh, the Commission on uh, Genetic Resources for Food and Nutrition. Francois, please. Oh, food and agriculture, sorry. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Co-Chair, and uh, I think thank you for the question. Uh, as you might know, I think one of the, the main tasks of uh, the Commission on Genetic Resources, uh, together with FAO, is of course to uh, try to monitor uh, the change uh, in genetic resources in the different uh, sectors. And uh, the question was uh, specifically uh, directed to uh, animal uh, genetic resources and animal diversity. Of course, I'm not an expert on animal diversity, but what I learned from uh, uh, the, the information we get from these different uh, state of the world is that the, we, we are like in the plant sector currently uh, seeing a decrease in the diversity of, uh, of uh, animal genetic resources. So it's again here the challenge is uh, how to uh, go back to a more uh, diverse uh, genetic basis and uh, more uh, locally adapted uh, genetic basis and i think this is this is of course uh, uh, true for uh, uh, also true for animal genetic resources you know i come from a from a country switzerland where on one end we had been very good at uh, 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 animal breeding common with high yield uh, uh, milk producing cows but at the same time we have also very difficult environment where uh, obviously uh, locally adapted uh, uh, animal races are, are a lot better and uh, this brings me to the, the very important point uh, raised by um, uh, Gerda. I think we really need to move from quantity to quality. And when we talk about quality, I think the, div the diversity of uh, animal uh, races is important, especially when it comes to locally adapted uh, animal races. Thank you very much. Yep. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Fang Suor. Uh, have I, as we still have our 10 minutes more, uh, I would like to have, I have one question from uh, Jacopo. Uh, he asking the question, what specific role do you think sustainable fisheries and aquacultures will play uh, in meeting growing demand for nutritious food and the need uh, to protect biodiversity? Perhaps I can give the, uh, this question to Gerda, please. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I think the role could be a big one, but let's not forget that the current fisheries, um, way of fishery in general, is still depleting uh, stock and biodiversity in the public uh, oceans, but also in the rivers. And the very uh, big, big um, um, uh, uh, ships are, um, um, are, are depleting uh, too much uh, in the way of fishery, so it's not really uh, sustainable. Secondly, when it comes to aquaculture, it could be a, a great alternative, however, and it could also be a good source of income. However, it's not easy, and as we speak, we see big problems with the use of too much uh, antibiotics in uh, doing the aquaculture, which is not very helpful because it is impacting both animal, uh, too many, the use of too, too much uh, antibiotics is impacting human uh, health, but also uh, animal health. So there are uh, challenges, but if, but if we are able to really do it in a sustainable way, meaning um, uh, giving the stock um, uh, and the fish, uh, the fish stock to time to recover and produce and have a have a happy uh, life and do aquaculture in a really sustainable way, then it could be a great, great part of the solution. And by the way, I really like fish. So for me personally and my family, it could be a good part of the solution. <laughs> I think all of us like fish. <laughs> Thank you very much for your uh, answers. Uh, we have another question from our uh, I, I, I know him very well, uh, Ambassador Mohammed uh, Imadi. 
I, I, I saw his uh, question. Uh, it would be appreciated to hear from panelists about the relationship of current most important global issues, the COVID-19 pandemic, and its possible uh, mutual impact on declining biodiversity. But anyway, we sometimes we have heard that uh, during the lockdown, uh, we, we, we see that a lot of improve in terms of our, our natures, in terms of the biodiversity as well. Perhaps I give this question to uh, Tony, yeah. Thanks very much. Um, yeah, it, and, and Gerda mentioned it in her intervention that the linkages between um, landscape, landscape health, ecosystem health, human health, are so interconnected. And when we take a sectoral approach, I mean, a sector actually means to differentiate, to have something as separate. And it is this integrated approach um, that we need. We know that 70% of, of zoonoses, um, that is where an organism jumps from, from animals to humans, have been forest associated. That is from the, the clearance of forests, the interventions, the unsustainable use of them. And, and that's a, a red flag and an area for us to be looking at um, uh, possible future zoonoses. There's, there may be a COVID 2025 and a COVID 37, um, 2027 or 2037. We, we need to be ready for those and to be able to respond and to be able to predict and interact. Biodiversity is incredibly complex. So we can't oversimplify it. Um, it's a system of interacting inputs, outputs, controls, processes, interfaces, boundaries, external effectors, and context. And until we have better information, until we put as much effort into understanding the natural world and our interactions with it through human health, we, we're going to continue to be surprised and, and, and devastated by pandemic such as, as COVID-19. Yep, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Simons, for your uh, response. Uh, I have another question, perhaps, um, actually, uh, maybe, Terry, you have any question for our speakers? Because I... <laughs> sure. I <still> <laughs> It certainly helps. I mean, it's a real, I mean, it's fantastic where there's so many questions coming in. I'm really enjoying reading them in the Q&A, reading them in the chat, but it's a bit of a juggle trying to yeah, exactly. uh, manage it all. I mean, it's a really great challenge to have because it's really good that there's so much uh, interaction. Um, so thank you, everyone who sent in questions. And I'm sorry that we're not going to be able to come to all of them. Um, but I do know that there's... Um, two sets, there are two more sets of issues, I think, coming out in the questions. And the one is, and we've tackled this a bit, one is, um, you know, alternatives to meat consumption and how can we really make progress uh, in providing alternatives to consuming meat? Uh, and that's, you know, uh, we've had a bit of a discussion about that earlier on. And I, you know, I, what I really wanted to say here is we recognize there are a lot of questions on that point. And when we write up our conclusions, we're gonna try and uh, reflect some of that debate in the conclusions. The other question that I don't think we've tackled yet on the panel um, is the question about financing. And in particular, I mean, I think both the executive secretary Marema and also Gerda Verberg had also mentioned the point that, you know, agriculture is hugely subsidized at the moment um, and what, uh, and there are a couple of questions really about financing and in particular about how the global biodiversity framework, what, it, what is it going to say about the role of agricultural subsidies? Uh, and what are the opportunities for financing, um, you know, nature-based solutions uh, that really try and combine all the interests of people and planet? Um, so, you know, I think that is a big question facing all of us. And uh, I can see that Francois, and it's very nice to be uh, working with you again, Francois, um, has got his hand up. So I'm gonna to come to you first, Francois, and then uh, on to Tony Simons. Um, over to you, Francois, thanks. 
Uh, thank you very much, and and thank you again for uh, raising the, these two questions. But uh, I think I, I just would like to to come back to uh, a point that I raised, and that was also raised by uh, by Tony in, in uh, his presentation. I think that's the 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 fact that we really need a, a system to be able to assess the in general the sustainable footprint of the the different systems, and more specifically the the biodiversity uh, component. Because if if we want to uh, uh, to reorient, uh, I would say the support, the public support to food and agriculture, not to use this word of subsidies, because I think I come from a country where we recognize that there is that what uh, food and agriculture is providing is also a public good, so that there is a need for a support from the public sector to food and agriculture, but we need to re, uh, uh, redirect this support towards uh, uh, the support to sustainable practices. And for this, we need to be able to measure it. We need to be able to measure the impacts of the current practices and to see uh, how we can change it to, to, to uh, uh, being more uh, sustainable. So it's again, uh, really to emphasize the importance of having a, a, a measurement reference system to be able to monitor. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Francois. I think uh, Gerber also would like to take the floor. I see your yes. hand. Yeah. Um, yes. Thank you very much. I would like to make an, uh, a general remark here because I appreciate very much to be in this panel. When I read the questions and go through it, I can see the clear entry point, which is the concern and the huge commitment to biodiversity which is great. And I uh, don't encourage you to step down from this uh, commitment. However, my invite to you is open up a little bit and look at things also from a different perspective. For instance, from a farmer uh, or um, uh, pastor, pastoralist's uh, perspective, if you are not in favor of animal protein, um, um, you can do so, but what will be the alternative for the farmer? So be ready to put yourself also in the shoes of uh, or the boots of a farmer, a community. What would be your solution? Don't expect uh, solutions from the top of the world because they have tried to come forward with solutions the uh, last 50 years. And are there, are there sustainable solutions? No. So sustainable solutions should be come from communities, from uh, country, bottom up. But let us uh, open our minds, change our mindset and um, challenge ourselves to put ourselves also in the, in the shoes of others. And my second point is wherever you want to start with it, with it in, in, in um, um, population uh, uh, policies or whatever, every start is a good start because every contribution to uh, get all the sustainable development goals implemented is a good one. But be ready to share and, keep and, and leave your logos and egos um, a little bit uh, at the door. Come to the table, only people in really wanting, ready to work together, will find solutions. Finally, on the financial thing, I think uh, innovative uh, finance, for instance, um, emissions uh, uh, taxes or CO2 uh, 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 trade can help. And on the subsidies, don't underestimate. If you start to fight, discuss the, um, the subsidies and you want to cut them, you are inviting the enemy to attack you. If you are making a positive agenda to change the direction and to support the right things to do, to support farmers in their uh, ecosystem stewardship, then you will get sympathy and it might, you might get it done or we might get it done. That's my... Uh, that's my thing. Thanks. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Gerda, for your intervention. Before I giving the floor to uh, ICC, uh, I have another question for our, our speakers, because we know that um, even though in one of your slides, you mentioned about the indigenous uh, people, and we know that uh, in terms of if we don't talk about the traditional eco, uh, uh, ecological knowledge, uh, I think it seems we're missing something. 
and we know that the indigenous people play an important role uh, to secure and conserve uh, the biodiversity. And that's why I would like to, to, to give the floor to our speaker to address the, the issues of the traditional uh, ecological uh, knowledge and also the role of the indigenous people. I have to give the floor to Tony, please. Great, thanks very much, um, Co-Chair. Um, you only need to look at a country like Papua New Guinea. It has 0.1% of the world's population. It has 0.3% of the world's, world's land area, but it has 7% of the world's biodiversity. It is a country covered in 75% of forest cover. And those peoples and those communities and their indigenous knowledge and their, you know, Papua New Guinea only needs 45% forest cover. It'll be fine. It'll be 50% more than the global average. The world cannot afford for Papua New Guinea to lose that forest. And Papua New Guinea cannot afford to keep that forest for the rest of the world with no um, uh, compensation. And so we've got to get away from these. It's got to be additional. If, if we're going to be paying countries to keep oil in the ground and not refine it and not contribute to greenhouse gas emissions, we've got to be doing the same for forests. And a lot of that is going to rely on that indigenous knowledge, those areas that are core, high conservation status, high carbon status, high uh, variation in biodiversity. And to link it back to the question in the text about, about SDG 10. And it's so sad that SDG 10 is about inequality. Inequality means the uneven distribution of resources. Inequity means the unfair distribution of resources. And it is inequity that we have to cope with and deal with those indigenous communities, those ones that are, have been the wise stewards and protectors of whole of humanity, and now that they're struggling and suffering. Fortunately, multinational com companies, many of them, um, the processors and the traders are ahead of countries. They're looking at the new task force on nature related disclosures in the same way they looked at the task force on climate related disclosures in a, in a legally binding way. Here we've got, we'll have regulators, we'll have shareholders, we'll have investors asking, what are you doing about biodiversity? Is this neutral? Is it enhancing or is it degenerative? And agriculture sadly at the moment is in the degenerative box. That's going to change. We've got two um, um, Dutch um, participants on this short panel here. And, and, you know, the Netherlands is focused on how the private sector can link through to these things. Think about food labeling. In a few years' time, CO2 labeling will be on every food packet. A couple more years, the water footprint will be on every food packet. What is the biodiversity footprint going to be on a food packet? We, we don't have any idea. I mean, three termites were saved in the production of this food. I mean, to our knowledge, no uh, amphibians were destroyed as we generated this food stuff. No, we, we're in the dark. So making the business case for biodiversity, making the business case for involving indigenous communities and making sure that we have a more equitous, not just equitable, but equitous society will be a combination. And I hope Co-Chair, I managed to weave in those three questions into one answer. Yep. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tony, for your uh, kind response. Now I give the floor to our ICC. Hans, please. Thank you very much, Jensen. And I was not uh, ready to take the floor, but I was so inspired by the discussion. Uh, and quite, I think, some 50 years ago, I was the president of the Commerce of the Party for Biodiversity. And I was impressed by uh, the biodiversity community the things they were developing and innovations they were seeking. And certainly I was, and I echo the words of Tony, I was impressed by the indigenous communities. And often, of course, when we speak about innovations, we look to new innovations. But many of the innovations are still there to grab when you look to the indigenous communities. And I think that's what we have to rediscover and to see how we can support them in their role for end biodiversity, as well as climate smart agriculture, as well as I would say sustainable food systems. And I think there, I think perhaps 10 or 15 years ago, we were still working a little bit in silos when it comes to biodiversity, agriculture, trade, et cetera. And I think the great thing of this morning is that we see that we have, have broken down the silos and see how we can 
work together to, to the common goal. But when it comes to financing, I think it's crucial that we try to broaden our financial basis for work to be done by and the, the, uh, the CBD as well as FEO, as well as some other organizations. And with the broadening of the uh, funding basis, I also mean the private sector, because I think the three Rome based agencies each have now developed and agreed to a private sector strategy to involve the private sector in how we can, I would say, fund programs with support of the private sector, which will end conserve and sustainable use biodiversity, but also make uh, climate of agriculture more climate and biodiversity smart. And their role is not to be underestimated uh, because they are eager to step in, but they have to sit around the table and give them a place in, in, in the funding. And the same, I think, is that we should look to innovative tools as well. Because often we go back to what the usual, uh, I would say, tools, let's set up a global fund and everything will be, will be funded. I think that's not the way how we should aim when we speak about biodiversity or speak about sustainable food systems. We need to have more innovative tools with the private sector, but also with other international organizations and institutions. And I think that's the challenge which we have for today, but also when it comes to the Food System Summit, how to develop new financial tools. Uh, but I'm impressed and I'm very uh, positive that we will we'll get there. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Hans, for your intervention. Before closing the first sessions, I would like to give the floor to my co-chair uh, to give us the result of the poll. Uh, Terry, please. Thanks very much, Tanua. So we asked you three questions, and here they're coming up on screen again. So the correct answer to the first question is that smallholder farms with less than two hectares manage only 12% of agricultural land, but they produce 35% of all food. Um, so as you can see, only 16% of you got that right. Uh, let's moving on to the second question. Um, indigenous people constitute only 5% of the world population. What share of protected areas do they manage? And the answer to that was 40%. Uh, and as you can see, 34% of, of us got that one right. And the final third question was, there are an estimated 6,400 mammalian and 11,000 avian species. How many of these have been domesticated? And the answer to that one was 40% uh, and 53% of those got that right. So uh, well done on that last question. Um, and that brings uh, it to an end. Uh, and I'm looking forward to uh, uh, our next poll result as well. Thanks, back over to you, Tanawa. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Terry, for the result uh, of the poll. And now we reached uh, to the end of um, the first session of this morning of the uh, Global Dialogues on the Role of Food and Agriculture in the Post-2020 Global Biodiversities uh, Framework. I would like to emphasize that uh, securing the sustainable use and conservation of biodiversity will become uh, even more significant and we need your commitment and we need your actions and to achieve uh, the global uh, biodiversity target. Thank you very much. Now I over the floor to uh, my co-chair uh, Terry to continue the second sessions of uh, this dialogue, please. Thank you very much Tanawa. And yes, and also another big thanks to everyone for all of their uh, interventions in um, in the discussion. Um, I'm very much looking forward to our second panel discussion, which explores different management aspects of biodiversity. And once again, we will have four speakers, each with a five minute intervention this time. Uh, and then we should have around 40 minutes for discussion afterwards. Um, I now have the pleasure of introducing our first speaker in this second discussion, Mr. Luca Montanarella. Mr. Montanarella leads the portfolio of soil related projects of the European Commission's Joint Research Center. He chaired the Intergovernmental Technical Panels on Soils for six years and was co-chair of the IPBES Land Degradation and Restoration Management. Mr. Montanarella's presentation is on soil biodiversity, the basis. Um, you have the floor, Mr. Montanarella. Five minutes, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for introducing me. And 
thank you for spelling well my, my, my family name, which is difficult. And good morning to everybody. Um, I will try to share quickly my two slides so that I can very quickly introduce to you a rather forgotten aspect of biodiversity, uh, which is um, biodiversity below ground. So biodiversity under our feet. Um, many people still don't, uh, uh, are not aware that there is very often more biodiversity in the soil than above the soil. So below ground biodiversity is under many aspects. To say that uh, we initiated um, some years ago, actually when we presented the EU soil thematic strategy in 2006 uh, as commission, um, we raised the, the issue that there is a need, there was the need at that time to have a better understanding of this uh, biodiversity pool. Uh, below ground biodiversity in many cases is still not even classified, so many taxa are not even identified. And so we, there was a process that has led to uh, the release uh, last year in the occasion of the World Soil Day uh, of the State of Knowledge of Soil Biodiversity report that now gives us a full picture of what is um, known about soil biodiversity. And, and I must really thank FAO and the uh, all participating organizations, including the Global Soil Biodiversity Initiatives, and of course, the support from our side for such a comprehensive assessment. Uh, we must be aware that there is life below ground. So a healthy soil is a soil that is alive and that is capable through this ecosystem that it's hosting to deliver a number of ecosystem services that are fundamental for us. Um, healthy soils produce healthy food and healthy food, of course, is the basis for healthy people. And we have heard many interventions in the previous discussion about the relevance of this. If you just take a, a, a spoon, a, a, a handful of soil, you will find millions of organisms in this little amount of soil, millions of billions of bacterial, thousands of different taxa. And all this needs to be recognized as an important biodiversity pool and needs to be protected. It needs to be protected not only because of the sake of protecting biodiversity, but as I say, because this is the foundation, the basis of healthy food production. Uh, a living soil produces healthy food, but it's also facilitating agricultural production by managing, of course, the organic matter, because at the basis of biodiversity in soil, there is soil organic carbon, which is the engine that gives the energy to that biodiversity pool to function well. So uh, having have in, in our hands now a very comprehensive assessment as was presented last year uh, of the state of knowledge on soil biodiversity it gives us now no excuse anymore not to act. Uh, 10, 20 years ago, the argument was we didn't know enough about soil biodiversity and that's why we couldn't do something to protect it. Now I think it's time to take advantage to, from the facts that we have now a solid scientific basis about biodiversity. We know a lot about it and we know also uh, the, the importance to all of us. We also know uh, what is threatening biodiversity, uh, what is threatening soil biodiversity, and we know all the pressures that soils are uh, submitted to due, of course, to our activities. Uh, particularly, I would like to mention that healthy soils uh, of course, uh, precondition for healthy food, but are very much under pressure due, for example, to soil contamination, to soil erosion, uh, loss of soil organic carbon, unsustainable agricultural practices. There are plenty of processes that are human induced that are threatening soil biodiversity, and we should absolutely do something about this. And so now we have the opportunity, now that the knowledge is there to act, and uh, as commission, of course, we have put soil biodiversity very much high on our agenda. We are developing, uh, as you may know, a soil strategy, a revised soil strategy based on the previous strategy that we already have. And this is embedded in the EU biodiversity strategy uh, because we think that it's a, an aspect that needs to be uh, taken into account in future policy making and needs to be particularly taken into account if we talk about food security, food safety, and healthy people with healthy soils. Thanks a lot for the time. Thank you very much, Mr. Montanarella. Our next speaker is Ms. Alzbeta Klein, Director General of the International Fertilizer Association, which is a global association of more than 430 member entities 
And Ms. Klein will talk to us about reducing pollution, managing fertilizers for profit and biodiversity. The floor is yours, Ms. Klein. I'm looking forward to hearing from you. Five minutes, please. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Ambassador Sarge. Thank you, uh, FAO DG Chu. Thank you, FAO colleagues, for the kind invite to this important event. I would like to talk about four things today. Uh, number one, the industry that I represent is fully committed to support and implement post-2020 biodiversity framework. The second thing I'd like to talk about is that our industry recommends development and implementation of regionally customized solutions. Because as we heard from previous speakers, biodiversity is, a, is an extremely complex topic. The third point I'd like to talk about is that there is no single solution to address biodiversity losses. And it really takes all of us to work together and bring in financial solution, to be able to make a difference. And last but not least, we have put our heads together as an industry over the past year as we are working towards the, the, the biodiversity uh, COP. And we believe that we do have a vision of what success should look like. So let me take these issues in, um, in turn. So first and foremost, um, we, are, we need to think about solving the problems of tomorrow. And we heard from Ambassador Verberg about this. Um, we need to solve the equation between food production and biodiversity. The critical issue that we have here is that fertilizers have increased agricultural yields in many parts of the world, and it assured economic development for the farmers. But at the same time, increased production of food has caused biodiversity losses. Uh, we are seeing what those losses look like and what happens when you have either too much or too little of a good thing, which is mineral fertilizers. Um, and, if, and, and the idea here is to really find that middle ground to not do too much, to not do too little, but it all depends on which regions we are talking about, where we are focusing, where we need to do less, where we need to do more. And what we need to think about is holistic system of food production. We need to start thinking about food losses and how to eliminate them or at least diminish them so that we don't have to produce this much um, of food to feed all of us by 2050. So what does positive and enduring change look like? As I mentioned, there are no silver bullets uh, solutions for addressing biodiversity issues. But there are many options that could have positive outcomes for nature preservation and food production. First and foremost, there needs to be a balanced approach that accounts for necessity of fertilizer management for food and nutrition security while prioritizing environmental protection. Consequently, we would recommend reframing the focus from focusing solely on, on pollution reduction and excess nutrients to the one that is focused on optimization of inputs. And again, regional voices, voices from local communities, voices from indigenous communities are going to be very important here. So what do we recommend? We would welcome the incorporation of nutrient management into global goals. This is very, very important and it needs to be part of the post uh, global biodiversity framework. And again, regional context is going to be essential. Uh, what we would like to see for the target is that we would like to see these customized roadmaps. We would take into account, and I think we heard it from uh, uh, Dr. Simons before, that we really need to start thinking about what does research tell us about various areas? What does research tell us about soil that Mr. Montanarella just talked about? And what does, the, what does this mean to bring farmers into that discussion and to have them have a voice in this conversation. So I would like to close my intervention with what success could look like. It would be a greatly reduced conversion of natural ecosystems into production land due to optimization of how we grow our food into better agricultural management practices and into better forest protection policies. It would mean sustainable intensification of existing arable lands through better farming systems and in incentivization and financial incentives to support farmers and their use of land. And last but not least, it's about global nutrient use efficiency levels that lead to improvements of biodiversity protection 
coupled with worldwide improvements in food and nutrition policy. So what we are suggesting here is a holistic approach that is looking at regional differences that takes into account farmer as a critical part of the equation and that looks at all the players with whom we need to build coalitions and the funding that needs to come to support it. Thank you very much, Ms. Ambassador. Thank you, Ms. Klein. I'd now like, uh, I now have the pleasure to introduce uh, Mr. Andrew Cunningham, who is Professor of Wildlife Epidemiology and the Deputy Director of Science for the Zoological Society of London. That's my hometown. Um, and he also serves uh, on the One Health High Level Expert Panel. The floor is yours for five minutes, Mr. Cunningham, over to you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to talk about the importance of biodiversity in a One Health perspective and how to reduce negative impacts on biodiversity in the context of food systems. So the, 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 the world is undergoing a global public health crisis following the zoonotic emergence of COVID-19. At the same time, the planet is undergoing a biodiversity extinction crisis is not a coincidence. Biodiversity conservation and safeguarding public health are inextricably linked through a range of complex ecological and socioeconomic pathways. Many drivers of biodiversity loss, such as habitat destruction, wild animal hunting and wildlife trafficking, are also drivers of zoonotic disease emergence. On the upside, mitigating actions for one of these crises will also likely mitigate the others. Perhaps the prime example of human overexploitation of wildlife, animals in wet markets are taken from the wild, brought together from different habitats, transported over large distances and crammed together into cages. Between capture and slaughter, they are stressed and immunosuppressed and so are increasingly likely to excrete whatever pathogens they have in them while also being increasingly vulnerable to infections they might not naturally encounter. People who are in close contact with these animals can be exposed to novel pathogens, creating the ideal circumstances for new diseases to emerge. The co-housing of different animal species exposes them to novel pathogens, and if a new species is successfully infected and becomes diseased, this facilitates the emergence of mutants and the likelihood of zoonotic emergence, particularly for diseases caused by RNA viruses, which have high rates of genetic mutation and host adaptation. COVID-19, SARS, Ebola, Marburg, AIDS, Nipah, and Hendra are all examples of recently emerged zoonotic diseases from wildlife that are caused by RNA viruses. To mitigate zoonotic risks from wild meat, the illegal wildlife trade needs to be stopped and the legal wildlife trade needs to be much more tightly regulated with meaningful enforcement. Such regulations should include improving animal welfare, minimizing transport distances of li live wild animals or fresh wild animal products, banning the co-housing or co-transportation of different wild and domestic animal species to reduce bridging host opportunities and minimizing time spent between capture and slaughter. COVID-19 has made us realize more than ever before that biodiversity is necessary for a healthy planet and is an important component in protecting human health. For example, the rich mosaic of species that occurs in undisturbed ecosystems inhibits opportunities for pathogens to build up into high numbers across animal populations, thus limiting the degree of human exposure to any particular wildlife pathogen. In addition, while human modified habitat becomes less suitable for some species, it becomes more suitable for others. And has, as has been recently demonstrated, the species of wild animal that are more able to live in human modified habitats tend to have a higher rate of carriage of zoonotic pathogens than those that have declined or disappeared. So we lose the protective effect provided by high levels of biodiversity, we increase the proportion of remaining pathogens that are zoonotic, and as the remaining animals are better adapted for living in human disturbed and peridomestic habitats, we increase the frequency of human wildlife contact and the chances of pathogen spillover. 
Hence, habitat destruction is a lose, lose, lose situation when it comes to zoonotic disease emergence. We need to cut to the chase, and by far the biggest driver of habitat destruction is agriculture. Yet, while 83% of farmland is dedicated to the production of meat and dairy, these animal products provide just 18% of calories and 37% of protein. And in doing so, they produce 60% of the greenhouse gas emissions produced by agriculture. A recent analysis published in the scientific journal Science shows that without meat and dairy consumption, enough food could be produced to feed the world with a 75% reduction in farmland. This means that humanity is unnecessarily using an area equivalent to the size of the entire USA, plus the European Union, the United Kingdom, China, and Australia combined. Imagine the huge gains in biodiversity and the public health benefits of reduced zoonotic disease transmission and healthier eating and the massive reductions in greenhouse gas emissions if everyone reduced their meat and dairy consumption, even if only by small amount. It has been estimated, for example, that in the UK, um, the UK would reduce its carbon emissions by 8% if everyone in that country replaced just one meat dish per week with a plant-based one. So reducing meat and dairy production has the potential to be the quickest and easiest way to tackle the biodiversity, climate, and public health crises all together in one fell swoop. With Thank the you very much. Of reduced water pollution, air pollution, and freshwater extraction. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Cunningham. And sorry to slightly interrupt at the end. I, I am keen to make sure that we have a, enough time for our discussion later. Um, and I would like, before that discussion, I would like to introduce our final speaker of this morning's session, Ms. Estrella Penunia, Secretary General of the Asian Farmers Association for Sustainable Rural Development. The association currently has 30 million family farmers as members uh, who are engaged in production of crops, livestock, fisheries, forestry, herding, and pastoralism. And it's my great pleasure to pass the floor to Ms. Penunia, who will speak to us for a five minutes before we move on to our discussion. And I should also flag up, we're going to have another quiz on some statistics um, for you. But let me first of all, hand over to Ms. Uh, Panunia. Over to you, you have five minutes, Madam. Thank you, Madam Chair, and good morning to everyone. Good evening here in Manila. So I would like to ask the Secretariat to flash my presentation because right now it's raining hard here. It, it, it stopped a while, <laughs> yeah, but we, I was asked to make a contribution on what are the contributions of family farmers in agrobiodiversity. So first, maybe we could uh, talk about who are the family farmers. So next slide, please. And family farmers, as FAO has defined, or family farming is a means of organizing agricultural, forestry, fisheries, pastoral and aquaculture production, which is, which is managed and operated by a family and predominantly reliant on family capital and labor, including both women's and men's. And the family and the farm are linked, co-evolved and combine economic, environmental, social and cultural functions. Next slide. And how many are the family farmers? Uh, family farmers account for more than 90% of the farms in the world, occupy around 70 to 80% of farmland, and produce more than 80% of the world's food in value terms. And farms which are less than two hectares account for 84% of all farms and operate 12% of all agriculture farms. And in Asia and Pacific, the family farmers account for 74% of the world's family farmers. And most of us are small scale and the family-based food producers account for in Asia Pacific for almost 80% of the milk and also 80 to 90% of aquaculture farms. And what are our contributions to agrobiodiversity? It is so sad to hear to say that agriculture is a very big uh, 
uh, emitter, no? But maybe we have to ask what kind of agriculture is that, no? Because family farmers contribute to agrobiodiversity. We manage natural resources and ecosystems. We preserve and promote biodiversity through agroecology, integrated, diversified, organic, climate resilient practices in farms, fisheries, livestock, and forests. We are custodians of biodiversity. We preserve and share traditional knowledge on food systems. Actually, our members know the value of diversity in food and agriculture because we have been very much affected by the lack of it and have been saved by its presence in the Philippines. For example, we have a cooperative of farmers who have devoted their lands to rubber farming. And when typhoon struck and all the rubber trees died, they had nothing to eat for weeks because their lands did not produce any crop for food. But the indigenous community of the Dumagats, they had food where the typhoon struck, they had just to dig yam and tubers for food. So what are our three enablers now for, for agroecology and for agro diverse uh, production. So first enabler will be the empowerment of the agency of small scale family farmers, which include fishers, livestock breeders, forest based producers and pastoralists. The second is an appropriate, coherent, aligned set of policies and programs that directs funding and investments and research to incentivize and support agroecology, integrated, diversified organic systems in farms, fisheries, and forests. And the third is a multi-stakeholder partnerships and inclusive governance that treats farmers not as beneficiaries, but as equal partners. I have a short video just to let you let see the work that some of our farmers are doing. So I would like to ask the secretariat to show the video. Thank you. And, that, and after the video, that will end my presentation. Is it possible? Thank you, Secretary. Okay. Please show the video. I, I hope it's a short one, though. Thanks. ဆီအပ်ပြန်ရှောက်ခဲ့ပါတယ်အဲဆိုတော့နှစ်ထောင်လေးမှာဆီအပ်ရှောက်ပြီးနှစ်ထောင်ငါးမှာပထမတဲ
our next poll questions. Uh, and I hope you've been listening hard because they'll uh, be putting your knowledge to the test. Uh, over to you, Tanawat. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Terry. I think uh, last, uh, the previous session, we also have the poll. And that's why we would like to have another quiz uh, for our audience and participants. And also our speakers can join us as well. Uh, the first question, uh, large farms of more than 50 hectares uh, make up only 1% of 608 million farms. How much the global agricultural land do they manage? I think from the previous uh, question of the last sessions is already give you a clue uh, to answer this question. Uh, the second question, what is the main driver of deforestation and forest degradation and the associated loss of forest diverse, uh, that biodiversity. Then you have a choice, uh, agricultural uh, expansions for large scale commercial agricultures. The second one is agricultural expansions for local uh, subsistent agricultures. And the last one is timber uh, timber harvesting and we encourage you to join this poll to quit your uh, to make sure that your knowledge or your information that you have is correct and I think you have got some uh, information from the previous session which helps you uh, to answer to, to give and write answers easily uh, for this uh, quiz. Right, Tanawa, are you going to keep everyone waiting for the answers till yeah, after sure, our discussion? Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. We will uh, share the answers immediately after, <laughs> after, the, after the poll. <laughs> Great. Uh, we, I can see that we've got the results coming in now, which is fantastic. And uh, I'll hand back over to Tanawa uh, to give you uh, the correct answers if if you don't, if you haven't heard them already from our speakers, uh, right? With that, I'd now, whoops, excuse me. I'd now like to uh, open our discussion, and we've had a fantastic uh, feedback. Lots and lots of questions and answers in the chat. Um, we're not going to be able to tackle all of them. Um, I'm going to start with perhaps one of the easier ones before moving into some of the more difficult ones. So. Um, we have a question from Uganda, I think from Gregory uh, Mugabe, I think, who says, what about the impact of solid waste on the biodiversity of soils? So um, perhaps we could uh, go to Luca Montanarella to respond to that one before I challenge the panel with some of the more tricky questions coming up in the discussion. Uh, uh, Mr. Montanarella, over to you on that question. Um, yes, thank you. And, and and just to say that it's a huge impact. Um, we are launching just now a new monitoring in the EU for microplastics in soils. And the amount of microplastics that we find in the first samples that we are starting to look at is amazing. You find now plastic residues practically everywhere in every place you sample, even in the most remote places. So um, th there is an issue uh, about the fact that we, tended in the past to think that soil is the waste, the place where we dump our waste. Uh, people think that if I dump something in the soil, well, I don't see it anymore and I don't have any problem anymore. And that's particularly crucial when, when we think of human health and of, of food health, because of course dumping in the soil contaminants uh, has been something that in the past has been widespread everywhere, particularly in, in our part of the world, in, in, in Europe, where we have a very old history of industrialization of mining. And so it's a big issue, probably one of the main issues, at least in our part of the world here in Europe, but also many other parts of the world. And, and I think raising awareness about the fact that soil is not the dumping place for our waste and that soil is the basis of our food and, and actually the basis of our health because healthy food is healthy people. It's something that we must uh, talk much more about and promote and, and make people aware of it. Thank you. Um, now we've had quite a few uh, questions in the chat and they're 
Uh, and they're all coming back to this issue about the impact of uh, livestock production, meat and dairy consumption on biodiversity. And there, um, we've heard, we've, we're hearing a range of views. We've heard a very clear message from Mr. Cunningham about the need to uh, consume less. Uh, but we've also had quite a number of concerns raised in the chat. So, for example, um, Felipe Melguez uh, says, I wonder if the increase of hunting and overexploitation of animals comes from the need to feed an economic need uh, through the sale of bushmeat. Uh, we've had another question about, uh, or another proposal um, that says perhaps the recommendation to reduce meat consumption should not be made in general, but really focused on areas where too much meat is consumed. Um, uh, and another, another question about how can we reduce the impact on livestock farmers uh, if the world is to consume much uh, less uh, beef cattle in particular. So you can see there's a whole range of different views on this issue, and indeed this is a dialogue. Um, so I've shared some of these, and I'd you know, really welcome uh, some feedback on this issue from all of the panellists. Um, so perhaps I could start with Mr. Cunningham and then I'll come to uh, Ms. Klein uh, and then Ms. Uh, Panunia and then back to you, uh, Mr. Montarana, Montanarella. But over to you, Mr. Cunningham. Uh, thank you very much, Co-Chair, and thanks for those questions. Yes, it's a, I mean, we're not going to solve everything overnight here. We're, you know, we're many decades um, working through a broken system. We're developing a broken system that is unsustainable for our planet. Um, so there will be winners and there will be losers as we, as we try to change the system. Um, and this is where we've talked, uh, people have talked already earlier in this session about subsidies, about the huge amount of subsidies that go into agriculture. Those subsidies are currently targeted at the wrong things. At the moment, it's cheaper to, in many places, many parts of the world, including the United Kingdom, it's cheaper to buy meat protein than it is to buy plant protein. And yet plant protein is so much more efficient and cheaper to produce. It's because the subsidies go into the meat protein um, side of, uh, unfairly go into the meat protein side of agriculture. And so I, I do feel for people, um, for, for farmers who are going to be affected by this. Um, we, we will, as a, as, a, as a planet, have to change our eating habits globally. Now, I know there are going to be local nuances in this, um, but we're talking about globally here at the moment. We are going to have to reduce the amount of meat and dairy um, protein produce that we consume uh, as humanity if we are going to have a sustainable planet. We've got to think of future generations here, not just of ourselves and what we like to do. Um, and so in order to do that, we're going to have to divert those subsidies that are currently pushing for more and more cheaper and cheaper meat protein to swapping that round to incentivizing people to have sustainable agriculture and less livestock farming. And where livestock farming is promoted or is encouraged that it's sustainable livestock farming, such as purely grass-fed rather than cereal-fed livestock. But even grass-fed livestock is much more dangerous to the planet when it comes to greenhouse gas emissions than um, producing plant protein. So, uh, and, and this is somewhere where I think the Food and Agricultural Organization really can take global leadership. You know, it really needs this, we, we as um, constituents who are to our governments can try and push this, but, but we also need leadership from, from the leaders and the FAO is a real global leader in this area. Great, thank you very much for that. Um, let me now hand on to our next, uh, or our next panelist, Ms. Klein, if you wanted to share your thoughts on the, on the real dilemmas about how uh, you know, the impacts of reducing meat consumption and dairy consumption. Thanks, and over to you. Thank you, thank you, Ambassador Sarge. I think uh, it, it's very important that we look at it uh, from a perspective of developing countries and developed countries and regions of the world where you may or may not have enough protein to, to feed the population and regions where we probably have more than, more than enough. What we have observed 
in international development is that when a country gets richer, it consumes a lot more animal protein. And if you look at just investments made in some of the large developing countries over the years, we have seen that shift time and again, and, and we are continuing to see it. So the question is, is there something um, that, that drives that type of consumption? Um, are those economic incentives? Are those taste preferences? Or is there just not enough uh, protein in a diet that leads those countries to do it? I don't have the answers, but I have observed the trend over the years. And the other trend that we need to see is uh, what's happening in part of Sub-Saharan Africa where you have to have food fortification for infants and small, small kids because there is not enough protein in, in a diet. And, and we have seen some of the efforts by um, UN agencies and, and companies to make sure that there is enough protein in children's diet to grow um, and to not have stunted growth. So my, my call here would be for a solution that differentiates between parts of the world between countries where we still need to get that protein to the kids and countries where perhaps we produce and consume a lot more than we should. And last point I'd like to mention is that we do have a range of technologies that allow us to do, um, to do protein differently. Um, if you look at the scale and growth of plant-based protein companies um, over the past two, three years, it is astonishing what has been done. And I do have every hope and faith that technology will get us to much more balanced um, view of animal versus plant protein. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'd now like to uh, hand the floor to Ms. Panunia for her views on, on this really crucial debate. Uh, yes, uh, you. thank you very much, Madam Chair. So I really don't have further uh, comments, but just just I was just thinking about, for example, our members in Mongolia, Kyrgyzstan, and Tajikistan who are pastoralists. Na? And uh, when, when, if we tell them, for example, stop uh, 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 livestock rearing, so where will they go? What will they do? Their countries are not, are not suited for, like, for example, vegetable farming or other farming but but for livestock raising so maybe we there is now i think uh, so much so many research and 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 documentation on sustainable livestock maybe we could talk about more on how to to do sustainable livestock rearing because uh then uh, and and what kind of practice do uh, of livestock rearing produce so much of this uh of these uh, emitters, no greenhouse gas emitters. So maybe we could differentiate them, them and contextualize, contextualize them, and then and uh, involve the livestock farmers in finding and implementing solutions so that there could be sustainable livestock rearing, or there can be a balance, no, between uh, animal and and uh, plant protein. No? Because I also think we can have a balance and it's always good to have a balance. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and finally, for this round of questions, let me pass to uh, Mr. Montanarella. Thank you, Madam Chair. And sorry if I tried um, and, and, and would like to make the point that plant-based proteins um, are essentially mostly coming from pulses. So mostly coming from um, plants that are able to fix nitrogen thanks to the fact that they live in a symbiotic relationship with uh, nitrogen fixing bacteria in the soils. And actually soils who are not able to host this nitrogen fixing bacteria will have quite a difficulty to uh, support uh, the pulses that produce uh, such plant-based proteins. So again, I'm sorry if I always come back to the root of the food production, which is the soil basis. Um, but again, fixing nitrogen it, and having rich protein production from, from pulses, for example, is, is, is linked to that issue that soils very often are depleted and are not anymore in that condition. Uh, but again, uh, this is bringing us far away from the general discussion. And I very much agree for, with what was said this morning. We should not be too much focused on our sectorial problems. I'm a soil scientist, so of course I'm a little bit distorted in all this, but probably we should put 
all the knowledge in a more holistic approach and see also all the context because probably a lot of the proteins we produce from from plant-based protein then end up in, in, in animal-based proteins because that's the main destiny of, of plant-based proteins. So um, yeah, with these words, I leave you and, and I hope that at least I raised the attention to the issue that everything starts from the soil at the very end. Thank you very much. Yes, you definitely have. And I will remember that for sure. Um, so I think um, I need to go and look in the chat again to see what the latest questions are. So while I do that, can I ask Tanawat to take you through the answers to the poll questions um, uh, and let you know how well we did with the answers? I, I, I think we did a little bit better than last time. Um, right. Uh, and also, just while I'm doing that, can I can I ask the Secretariat to answer one of the questions in the chat about what happened to a presentation from Indigenous peoples? I'm not sure what the answer to that is, but perhaps somebody can put that in the chat. Ah, OK. Irena is telling me that they weren't able to present the, the Indigenous peoples presentation. Um, but if the Secretariat could just put that in the chat to confirm, that would be helpful. Thank you. Um, right, so over to you, Tanawat. Uh, to present the results from the poll uh, while I have another quick look at the question and answers. Thanks. Ah, oh, here they come up. Tanawat, are you there? No, no, okay. Okay, so Irena tells me, uh, I'm not quite sure what's happened to Tanawat. I know it's very late in the night in Bangkok, um, but the, uh, Irena tells me that the answer to the first question is right. Um, large farms of more than 50 he hectares make up only 1% of 600 million, 608 million farms. How much of the global agricultural land do they manage? And you were right, the answer is 70% or 42% of us were right. Um, and then the second question we asked, what is the main driver of deforestation and forest degradation and the associated loss of forest biodiversity? And here again, the answer is agricultural expansion uh, of, for large scale commercial agriculture. And here 75% of us got that right. And, and indeed several of our panelists have made the very same point this morning as well. Um, right, I'm not quite sure, um, but what, I'm, what I am just going to do now, so you're gonna to have to give me uh, a few minutes break while I just check the latest questions in the Q&A. Um, just give me two minutes uh, and I'll come back on and uh, make sure that we use the rest of our, I think we've got another 23 minutes for this session and I'm keen to make the most of the discussion. Uh, I'm just gonna review some questions and answers and I'll be back with you in two minutes.
Right. Thank you, uh, everyone. Thanks very much for bearing with me while I did a quick review of the questions. Um, and uh, we've got a very practical question from, um, I hope I'm going to pronounce his name right, uh, Josik, Josik Van Drom. Uh, and he's asking practically what measures can be developed to support farmers to convert to other types of production which are healthier and more sustainable and more protective of biodiversity and global food security. Um, we'd be uh, really be really good to hear uh, different ideas from all of the panel members. So over to you. I'm going to start in a different order this time and perhaps uh, start with uh, Estorella Panunia first, uh, and then we'll come to uh, Mr. Cunningham, then Mr. Montanarella, and then Ms. Klein. Uh, over to you, Ms. Panunia. Yes, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. You know, uh, just a month ago, we conducted a survey on, on traditional local crops or what uh, some sectors call forgotten foods or still some sectors call neglected and underutilized species. So we conducted a survey with around with 3,087 3, farmers in Asia Pacific. And it was really good to know that 90% uh, of them still uh, prac uh, plant, not plant, uh, produce a traditional food crops. Although they say that they, they, they produce it only for uh, cons uh, own consumption, own consumption, or, or for for subsistence. And when we ask them in the questionnaire, what are the uh, what are the the things that they need to support to support them? They say first is uh, uh, some uh, market, um, market market for their crops because usually uh, farmers uh, go to the traditional cash crops, but if they can find markets for these crops, they can grow more. Uh, second is uh, information campaign, especially to consumers about the, nutri the nutrition, the nu nu nutrients of, of these uh, traditional food crops. So it's very basic also for consumers to appreciate, for example, sweet potato or yam as food and not consider, the, consider this food as a poor man's diet, for example. Third are investments in, in participatory research and innovation, especially on how to uh, produce, produce them more and also to process them so that they will have a longer shelf life. For example, a cooperative of women farmer wanted to, uh, to uh, sell edible fern, edible wild fern. Uh, in a market in an urban poor community two hours away from them when they traveled in two hours time the edible fern was wilted already so no one would would buy it so maybe some innovation especially on prolonging the shelf life in a natural in a more natural way for this uh, crop so basically in general support no support uh, support in terms of financing for research, for innovation, for for education, for for uh, peer learning or farmer field schools, uh, so that we could uh, massively uh, transition to agroecology and to diversified farming, putting incentives in the right place for products or for production that is. Uh, doing agroecology or integrated and diversified farming. Thank you. Thank you very much. And that's a, a, a real positive way forward. Let me uh, pass now to Mr. Cunningham. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, um, I agree with all of that. I think um, diversification is really important. And we, we've gone too far down the intensification road um, in many parts of the world. Uh, changing subsidies from just producing more and more and more of the same to building in um, ecosystem services, biodiversity protection and preservation, um, public services that, that agriculture or farmers can, can provide to, the, to humanity, to the planet, rather than just um, with the one goal of producing more and more and more of the same of the one thing 
Um, when it comes to wild meat, we should be promoting sustainable harvesting and have and give local people ownership. Local people will look after things and make sure that they're sustainable because they know that their lives and livelihoods and their their families' lives and livelihoods will depend on it. So giving people back um, ownership of, of the land and, um, and helping to ensure that there are there's support in understanding the need for quotas and, and where over harvesting becomes a why over harvesting is an issue and why it's a problem. We have the tragedy of the commons often where everybody has a, it's a free for all so people take as much as they can and that just leads to complete depletion and we've seen that with fisheries and fisheries are now trying to get the act together through quotas and so on. Um, um, we might need to have some sort of similar system for wild meat harvesting. Wild meat is a really important part of this um, issue. And I'd just like to make the point that, um, you know, when, I, when I'm talking about the, the problems produced to the planet and to people's health from uh, the amount of reliance on, on meat and dairy, it's not a black and white issue. I'm not advocating that we stop all livestock farming and we stop all dairy farming. I'm saying that we need to look at this issue, look at the evidence, look at the science, and look at where things need to change and how they need to change. I'm not saying that, oh, there are pastoralists there, they need to stop eating meat as well. How, what do we tell them what to do? That's definitely not what I'm saying. I'm saying that you need to, you need to look at where the, where the balance is wrong and rebalance it. And the balance is almost always wrong because of the way that the financing has been put in place by people from up there, not by local people. Um, so give local people back the land is one of the best ways forward, I think. Thank you very much. And yeah, I think one of my takeaway messages from our discussions this morning is the need for differentiated solutions uh, and balance and certainly uh, in a few minutes, I'm going to come to our sort of takeaway points. But first of all, I want to uh, finish this round of interventions and let me uh, come back to Mr. Montanarella. Uh, and then after you, we'll finally go to Ms. Klein. But Mr. Montanarella, over to you. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, yes, um, I think showing the way forward is what we need to, to do. And actually, Maybe you are not aware, but the mission, the, the European Commission recently established a mission on soil health and food. Uh, the mission has the target to achieve for the EU 75% of healthy soils in 2030. And the way forward that the mission board recommended to us, a group of high level experts, is to establish a dense network of what is called lighthouses and living labs. Essentially going back locally, uh, involving those farms that are doing sustainable soil management that are showing the way forward in a sustainable way and creating a sort of local movement, a local participatory movement that involves locally uh, through demonstration of positive actions, also others will follow. And this in the living labs approach is also allowing to involve other stakeholders, involve all the entire local community into that. And what is reassuring to us is that we have in the past examples where this worked. Probably the best known example of uh, the successful legislation on soil protection is the US Soil Conservation Act. Maybe some of you know about this. In the 30s, the US was struck by a, a big process called the Dust Bowl, which tremendous soil degradation processes in the US Midwest. And the Soil Conservation Act that successfully uh, limited this problem, and actually now we have very low erosion rates in the US, was based to the, through the creation of local soil conservation districts. The soil conservation districts that at that time the Roosevelt administration invented, something completely new, was it indeed creating a local community of farmers together with local stakeholders, together with experts sent there by the US Soil Conservation Service and together with local administrators to act against the practices that were essentially creating the soil degradation pro problem. And I think the success of that act is an example of, of a way forward where you can positively act 
of course, always locally, as was said already by previous interventions, it's not that we can solve the problem sitting probably in our offices, neither in the commission nor in FAO. Uh, uh, the problem gets solved locally by the local actors and we need to create an environment that enables them to act positively. And that's probably the best way forward that I can imagine. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. And I, I do remember there was a massive investment in the Tennessee Valley Authority, wasn't there, a US investment in that to make that happen. Um, let me um, finally hand over to you, Ms. Klein, uh, the final intervention from this uh, round of speakers. Uh, and then I'm going to try and summarize uh, what I've heard today. Over to you, Ms. Klein. Thank you very much, Rex. Couple of things, as a lot of things have already been said, so I'd like to add just two. One would be to make sure that the farmer is incentivized not only with what she produces, but also the land that she leaves behind. And we have made a great progress in carbon because there are now ways to remunerate farmers for the incentives of keeping carbon in soil. I believe the same needs to happen for biodiversity. And I know we are a few years behind in biodiversity compared to climate carbon, climate slash carbon, but that's the way to go. Farmers have to be incentivized. And the second way to do it is to make sure that farmers have economic incentives to do it. We have seen um, artisanal schemes where farmers have, have shown that if they have economic incentives, they do the right thing for the planet and right thing for feeding themselves, their families and the world. But I think we need to scale that up and we need to support it with financial incentives and with all of us working together to make sure that everybody looks at the double bottom line when they farm and when they eat. Thank you. Right, well, thank you very much. I, I want to try now and try and attempt to summarize the key points that I've heard from our discussion this morning. Um, it's not gonna be perfect because, um, um, you can see, of course, I'm a mum, so I'm good at multitasking, but I'm not that good at multitasking. So you're going to get my first draft. Uh, and then hopefully it will uh, improve uh, in the course of this afternoon as well. But just before I do that, I want to say a huge thanks to all of our panelists and speakers and to our audience for their really enthusiastic uh, participation in the questions and answers. And also I want to apologize because I know I've missed lots of questions and that's not been deliberate. It's just been the fact that I just can't do it all at one go, um, but thank you. Now, let me, let me try and summarize where I think we've got to. So from my perspective, and I think Tanuat is offline at the moment, so we haven't had a chance to consult, but we will this afternoon. Um, the overriding challenge I have heard from all of the interventions is the challenge of meat consumption and production. Uh, and, you know, we've had some really clear views that it's really bad for biodiversity, it's bad for the climate, and or equally real concerns about what is the impact of uh, reducing meat production consumption on uh, small farmers in particular. So that, you know, that is an absolute challenge. Uh, um, I've really enjoyed the debate on that. I think what I have heard as well is very much that I think everybody agrees that there isn't a one size fits all solution to this, that solutions need to be tailored to local realities and local situations. Um, and I, I haven't heard anybody disagreeing with that at all. So that, you know, that's great. And I do think, you know, we should uh, focus on that. I think the other really big uh, point that I, I've heard a lot is that, uh, public support to agriculture plays a crucial role and there's a huge opportunity to redirect that public support and create incentives that work for livelihoods, that work for the people and the planet as well. So, I, I mean, that, that seems uh, to be, I think, I, most people I think seem to would agree with that. Um, I think, you know, the other, I guess, big point that I'm that's come out to me as well is the need for collective action. Uh, we've took, lots of us have talked about partnerships and the need to work with each other, and that's absolutely right. And of course, um, the the whole uh, conference of parties on biodiversity, on climate change, that is all about collective action. And uh, it's really good to really underline that call that we all need to work on this together. Um, I think other key message I've heard um, is 
innovation, new crops, there are solutions, there is an opportunity. And, you know, we need to invest in innovation, in solutions, into ensuring that there are markets for those solutions as well. Um, I'm almost coming to the end. I think the other point that I've taken away in particular uh, is about the need for metrics. You know, several speakers have talked about how we can now ma manage or how we can now measure the impact of uh, uh, our, our actions on climate change, but we can't, we cannot yet do that with biodiversity. And it seems that that is, uh, you know, developing those metrics and using them in a way that um, they can really bring attention and identify solutions is really important. Um, I'm going to stop there. As I said, I know it is a, a very imperfect summary that I will try and improve during the course of the afternoon. Um, but I wanted to. Uh, Finally, just say thanks again, and I can see that Maria Helena DDG Samedo is uh, online, and perhaps I should hand back to you, Maria Helena, to uh, wrap up this morning's session. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Terry and uh, Ambassador Terry Sarch and Ambassador Tenawat, and thank you all for your participation, your contribution. I think it has been a very substantial debate where we show the importance of uh, the different uh, agriculture and uh, approaches, the different farming approaches and how we can really improve the conservation and the sustainable use of our natural resources and our biodiversity to produce more, but produce better and smart as uh, Ambassador Verdagenburg Verbord said. Uh, as uh, you see is on the hands of our co-chairs, they will, summarize what we have discussed today. We'll put together the recommendations coming from the discussion this afternoon, and the summary will be presented tomorrow to uh, our high-level panel, where we'll be having uh, ministers, um, United Nations representatives, IFI's representatives to take it further. I think is a, is a question where we all together needs to have a holistic approach we need to, to move at scale and we need to find what are the best solution, keeping in mind that we don't have one solution. We have the solutions which needs to be tailored to the different uh, zones, to the different regions and to the different perspectives. Thank you again, Ambassador Terry Sachs, Ambassador Tenawat for this facilitating. It was a great facilitation. Our panelists, all of you, I cannot mention uh, you all, but thank you for joining us and please keep with us because we have this discussion this afternoon and also tomorrow. Have a nice lunch and see you in the afternoon. Thank you again. Bye. Thank you all to our participants also. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.